Could, could we say that he's the healthiest man in cricket? I would say so. It's a little bit of masculine, isn't well, it? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's it, awful. It is. It's, it really is. Yeah. yeah. I didn't really know what I was signing up for, I don't think. It's made me, uh, made me have this like, newfound love for Tracy. I'm like, oh, I love you so much right <laughs> now. <laughs> and crushed. <laughs> Really, really excited to introduce David and Carolyn Willie. What a lovely couple to have today in the studio. This <laughs> is going to be a fun, filled health chat. Yeah, I'm excited. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thank okay. you. Could, could we say that he's the healthiest man in cricket? <laughs> I would say so. Yeah. Oh, we could, we could I mean, argue that he's I would say cricket. so. Because I think one of the videos I watched of David was him planking, and the guy just going, "Can you stop now, please? Can you literally just stop planking? Because we've been you're we're now five minutes me. in. You're embarrassing us." Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, look, I think, I think I'm a little bit left field in in sort of my health, if you like, from you know the mainstream of cricket. But you see a lot of people now sort of turn into. To what I'm doing and showing a bit of interest in what I'm doing, asking questions, both players and and you know the pro the professional staff as well. The funny thing is, mm. you said about people, you know, looking at us and thinking, you know, we're coming from one angle, but this is actually the first time we've really even chatted about anything to do with our personal health issues, especially mine. Mm. Um, so not not a lot of men. Well, nobody will really know what them challenges have been to be honest because we've kept that quite private it's only now that i have found help with other people online like yourselves and other communities that i've gone actually i really want to chat about this because they've been i mean people that follow cricket will know that david has pulled out of some really high profile tournaments one being the ipl mm -hmm. this year and it, it was to come home and help me with my health struggles because I was at home with two small children on my own and, um, you know, everybody just thought, what's, what's that about? Why would, why would you not go play in the IPL? And I was like, well, I've got to go home and take care of my wife. And then nobody really knew why. <laughs> mm. So, and it, it's a lot more complicated than it seems. I had to, you know, message and say, don't worry, I'm fine. But there are some things that we've got to work out, um, you know, health-wise before we can be apart again for another two months. David left in January. He was supposed to be away for five and a half months and it was, you know, it's was, it was a long time to be apart. And that's why we we kind of navigate our family and work life so that I can travel with the children mm. and, you know, be together as a family whilst David's still pursuing his career and, um, you know, making the best of it that way. So, yeah, it is actually the first time we've really chatted about it. How, how, did, that, how did that feel then? Just like going, right, I'm going to take, take a step back from the IPL and just focus on family and look I mean I think personally family comes first um we always say that so Agreed. you know that's the most important thing for me but everybody else looking in they have their own opinions on it and you know generally they're pretty pretty negative there's yeah. obviously people that understand and are very supportive of it but you know a lot of people just looking in and saying you turn down that lucrative contract and xyz um, so, you know, there's, there is that side of it, but, you know, the most important thing is my family, um, Carolyn's health and, and making sure we're okay. That's the true long-term investment, isn't it? It is. Yeah. yeah, we're doing this for our family. You know, we've always made plans that is, that's what's been best for the family. And, you know, it's hard being away from David for a long time. The kids find it hard. I find it hard managing the kids' emotions. They're older now. I mean, my son, I did both of them, but Jacob, he's been on 100 flights. So, you know, I I took a step back from my career so that I was free and had no ties to travel with David so we could be together as a family. And I, I, personally, for me, I want to be with my children and we want to be together as a family. But how we can do that was a challenge. There was no way that both David and I could both be traveling and pursuing our own paths and raise a young family. So right the past five years have been busy <laughs> we've moved we just moved to Northampton from Yorkshire whilst David was playing in a world cup mm. new school new county new home it was busy um and then we went to India as well to, to join David so we have to look at short term right 
what's the next three months look like? Okay, how how many weeks are going to be together? Where are we going to be together? Is that at home? Is that there? Right, what do the kids need at school? Can we take them out of school here? You know, we have to look at our situation as a very unique it's not just the norm. Oh, you're going on holiday. No, we're traveling to be with David. Oh, so you're having a lovely time in the UAE. Uh, no, we're going to be in the hotel room and trying to do the best schoolwork and family time. And we just, that's our time to be together. And that's what we need to do. It's a juggling act, isn't it? Yes, it's a it's massive juggling, juggling act. And, you know, you take kids out of school, that, that carries a bit of a bit of a stigma that, um, you know, is talked about quite a bit now. I think with fines and stuff that come in, we're... Fortunate the school they're at is very supportive of it and understands the importance of us being together. So, mm. um, but yes, we put too much on our plate, don't we? And yes, we've, we're guilty of that a lot. And that's sometimes when these opportunities come for David. And, you know, or sometimes, I mean, I've given up opportunities that come because David's traveling and I, I don't want to be away from the kids at the same time David is. They are emotionally juggling how they feel about daddy being away as well. So I'm their constant and I choose. It's not nobody's fault. I choose to be home so that they have mummy there all the time and they don't feel insecure or, you know, have anxiety about that. Mm. We don't want cricket to be something that takes daddy away. It's our family thing. So it's like, right, how do we make pennies this month? Right, well, Daddy's going to go here and then he's playing in this team. Here's your shirt. Come on. You know, we're, 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 we're all cricket family. Mm. Cricket is our family. It's not daddy's. So... That's how we choose to manage it. Everybody's individual. There's lots of other cricket families that do things different ways. But for us, that's what we have decided is, is important to be together. That's important to be our family yeah. thing. I'd really love to get into the, the meat of some of the things that you've been experiencing. Yeah. But to provide a little bit of context for this, I'd love to know a little bit about your kind of relationship with health across your lifetime because yeah. I think sometimes um you know we can trot along in this world just assuming you know if our health kind of feels okay we're not thinking about it too much until something can happen yeah. um so I'd love to know a little bit about kind of what your overall relationship has been and then if you're willing to share a little bit more well we've already we've always been generally healthy really yeah. I guess we've never been you could never tell <laughs> yeah, we thought we were. We thought we were healthy. Yeah. You know, I my my background growing up was dance, music, drama, and you both look incredibly healthy on the outside. I'm ten years older than David as well, look. so I thought getting a younger husband would make me feel younger, Jeez. but it doesn't. It makes you feel older because I'm like, I can't keep up. <laughs> He's like, What are you doing? I'm like, I've got ten years on you, mate. God, give me a break. <laughs> so yeah, no. So um, I mean, David's always been healthy. Fit, I guess. But um, yeah, we've we've y y you were partial to a can of coke. Or yeah, I was way, just thinking about that. I used to <laughs> the dirty secrets are coming. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's what I say. We thought we were healthy, but then actually, you know, the convenience foods, the the cans of coke and the diet coke that you think, oh, that's a better choice. But then actually, probably over the last two years, where well, we've actually started to look at things a lot more closely. And but you were educated um, very differently in sport and nutrition. So what mm. you know they. When David was younger and they're saying, here, you need these carbs to perform yeah. and then you need this, you know, it was a very different way that you were taught to look after your body and your health. So, you know. Car carb loading, I'm guessing they were like, oh, day before you need to carb load yeah. and make sure you've got all that pasta and bread and everything, all the cheese on top just in case and yeah, get yeah, it in there. Yeah, absolutely. And it's only, you know, the, the tests that we've done over the last couple of years, actually, that's probably the worst thing I could have been doing, um, the way I metabolize sugars and my glucose spikes and then crashes like it just created a vicious circle actually mm -hmm. and then making an adjustment to have a higher fat lower carb diet like my physical condition my aches and pains i thought i was getting just getting older and waking up stiff and then all of a sudden made these these changes um and you know less soreness better mental clarity um you know not having these crashes in, in glucose and all of a sudden, you know, I was operating at a much, much better level um, across the board. And it was just understanding my body and what I need rather than just trusting what a professional is telling me. But yeah. what was that change then? Like, because it, it seems like there's a story to this because was, was there a bit of fear or was there like, I'm going to, you know, stop earlier than I needed to? What was it? 
Um, well, it was it, instigated from my. It health, was really wasn't it? started with with you, um, and was it glucose revolution? Well, what we... actually happened? Well, I'll, I'll chat to you about that. It kind of is a long story. <laughs> get back dates. Mm. So we were told that we couldn't have children mm-hmm. um, when it was actually not long before we got married. They told us it was both David and I. So um, I'd always. Sort of, oh, what do you mean? But both of you? Like yeah. You, said, you mm. both. So a very strange story there. It's a very strange thing. Oh, wow. <laughs> so strange. Um, so I I'd always had PCOS. I never had a regular cycle my entire life. Um, sometimes I didn't have one, a period at all, uh, in a year. Um, so, I mean, that was, I'd say, normal for me. I didn't have any real education on that. I mean, I'm 43 now. So back when I was 18 and I was told that I have, polycystic ovarian syndrome um you probably won't be able to have children it was a oh nobody really knew anything about hormones then that was that was as much as much information as i got and they put me on a trial for metformin it was the first time metformin was ever given and i took it maybe for like six weeks and i never liked taking tablets so even then my parents will tell you i had a very dramatic panic attack of i don't want to take this oh, I don't. and then from dad never was on the contraceptive pill or anything like that because I didn't want that something inside me just said no I gotta tell you what that was I just was like no it's it's not right I don't want to take it so I didn't um so I just had these symptoms over a long period of time many years and dealt with them um the anxiety attacks everything that comes with PCOS they the facial hair that I had I was just so so conscious about as a woman and I was a singer and a performer and an actress on stage. I was just trying to cover my face all the time because I just felt so conscious about it. Um, <clears throat> so I didn't know anything about managing hormones. Hormones were causing that at all. It was just, you can't have children. You've got something called PCOS. Off you go. And that was it. What a hard um, thing to be It told. was. Yeah. yeah, it was. And then, you know, I suffered. My family are all small. My family are tiny, petite genetically just made that way and I have always been smaller um you know and active and dancing but but in comparison to my family I was bigger mm. you know it's the one that would get bloated and then oh one day I was thin then I wasn't then I was but it's just something that I didn't understand and just thought that was normal for someone that a young girl and then fast forward many years <laughs> I met David <laughs> and I don't know really what happened other than my periods came. I I fell in love. They released some pheromones and suddenly my barber said, Baby Daddy is here. <laughs> that's, that's that's actually maybe what that's what it was it was. It was just waiting for you to meet the right person. But it that's was true, but Mother Nature said, like I obviously released a, a hormone. Mm. When you fall in love, you 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 know, yeah. happy and you release serotonin and oxytocin. Whatever it was, they came mm. back and I were having them every three months. And I went to the doctor and th- it was them that said, well, you're ovulating. Um, take your ovulation test and see. Not, not that we were trying to get pregnant then. It was just for me to monitor what was going on in my body. Um, and then um, I don't quite remember. This is going back nearly 10 years now. But it was um, we did some tests and they suggested that we were tested as a couple if we were planning later on to have a family. Because actually, I think they wanted to put me on some medication for something. And they wanted to do some tests to see if, if it was all right for me to be on that because I couldn't be on it for a long time. So David was like, yeah, sure, I'll do a sperm test. <laughs> I've always wondered what it was. Do the sperm test. The yeah. I've always wondered. <laughs> I've been there, don't worry. Yeah. It's very <laughs> awkward. <laughs> he's he's yeah. thinking this is where Kaz is going to go too far explaining what happened. <laughs> <laughs> But he was like, yeah, I always, I always wondered how many was in there. <laughs> but the sad thing came back. He was like, they've told me I've got to do it again because it wasn't, I don't know why, it wasn't sufficient, you know. It's a little bit of masculine, isn't well, it? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's it, awful. It is. It's, it really is. Yeah. I didn't really know what I was signing up for, I don't think. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah. What have I got myself into is, is the question that you ask yourself because you're just like, yeah, Here's a cup. Yeah. Here's a cup. Yeah, off you off go. You go in, like... in this yeah clinical room and yeah. Yeah, it and it was that awkward. was to test though, wasn't it? To see, but it came back. I mean, you did three, and they said, mm. but they took us into a room. 
this is like exactly what happened. The doctor took us both into a room and basically said to us, his words were, you've got more chance of winning the lottery than having a baby, both of you. Wow. Like that was actually what he said to us. Wow. And we were both sat there going, pardon? So he said, well, David's, and these were words we didn't understand then. David's morphology and his motility and da 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 you know, it wouldn't even get into your egg and you don't regulate, you, you've not got regular cycles every three months and, you know, uh, IVF could be an option, but save you money. And we were like, ouch. We actually laughed, didn't we? Because we, we did, yeah. We, were, we, we thought... What? It's a shock, isn't it? Well, how yeah. are you supposed to respond to that? Yeah, but like, so... Yeah. I mean, yeah. before, like, before we got married and things, we'd had a conversation. I mean, your vows of, you know... If it's just us two, and yeah, um, so we'd had the conversation that if we if we couldn't, um, you know, we wanted to be together regardless. Yeah. So, but then you know, fast forward to to get that news from a, it was a heavy conversation. To yeah, have, again, it, it you know. really is, yeah. and it delivered that way as well. Mm. I think is so it can be shocking and mm. cold because it's not it does it's not a small thing for people mm. um well you know if, if you don't mind me saying but it was so for me i i kind of had dealt with a lot of things like that in my mind over the years but david was so new and fresh to be told that actually you won't be able to have children you're not working properly mm. and there was one night and it was not very far off our wedding he woke up and he was sweating and he was upset and you know he was like i, I can't give you any children like do you still want to marry me like yeah a million percent like it's fine mm. but it was a real it was actually trauma it was a yeah. traumatic thing to have been told mm. and then to respond to um but yeah so we decided very casually to not make a big deal out of this we said you know we will maybe give ourselves Three girls over five years, be very open about doing IVF. Um, we'll give it a go. We'll try. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We're not going to be like, oh, we're doing IVF. We're just going to like, tell our family, right, we're going to do IVF. We're going to give it a go. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And let's just concentrate on ourselves and be married. And, you know, but we decided to start straight away after we got married mm. because we were... No time like the present? Yeah. Mm. And no also, present, right? well, this is probably going to take years. And I was 10 years older. We got married when I was, how old was I? 33? Yeah, 33. And let's just start now and see. And uh, if it didn't work first time, it did. <laughs> I think that's the thing. I mean, we were that, I think what for us, just being open with it, with friends, family, it made it a less stressful. Oh. I mean, and you the, really the, suffered with the whole process, actually. But but the young um, lads in cricket really were quite shocked that you were so open about, I've been told I can't have kids mm. and we're going to have IVF. And they were like, what? Mm. It was like, it was a real, a really empowering moment for you actually to say, yeah, this is this is the situation and, you know, it's how it is and this is how we're going forward. Mm. And that was the first time ever that you were, um, I, I think, a, a mature man emotionally to all his peers, so. I mean, I was 26 at the time, so yeah. I'm, you know, still. Baby. Relatively young, actually. Yeah. 26 and kind of in like an athlete as well. Probably so it's yeah, those yeah. kind of yeah. things that you yeah. don't expect. You just, um, you, we do just go through life thinking, oh, I'll be all right. Yeah, you just assume right. you're like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I'll buy a house eventually, I'll have kids, yeah. I'll, you know, do, yeah. do that thing. Um, I wanted to provide the context as well, because I'm conscious that Dilly was responding like, oh, yeah, yeah. So Dilly actually was told that he was infertile. I know you won't mind me, me saying. I like have no you, fear. You know me. I'm, I'm very open about my personal <laughs> life. It doesn't bother me at yeah. all. But I'm you, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but just so you understand the the context for Dilly being like, yeah, I, I get it. <laughs> um, so years before we even began dating, he was uh, told he was infertile. Mm. Keratozoospermia, I think is, that is how you pronounce it. Yeah. What? Kind of. It's a dim to do with like the sperm being, not lazy sperm, but it's just not functioning the way it should be functioning. Yeah. So yeah. you've got all your chromosomes, your X and Y, but they're yeah. just kind of lazy. Yeah. Basically, yeah. yeah. It, was, was, it was literally it. That was what? That was mine as well as not formed properly. Well, we found out actually later and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. that David's um, antibodies are so active in healing him 
they actually deformed all his all the body of his sperm. Oh, no. So he, I mean, even now, if if somebody says, "Oh, you've got an injury," it's, you'll be out for eight weeks. David will be back within three to four weeks. He's just body response so <sighs> really he just good. Works really right. hard. So and are we saying that David's basically like the the version of Wolverine that we just don't is, know yeah. about? <laughs> that we he need is. to pull his blood. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do always say this. I'm like that. You are just an odd guy. Things just. I'm just odd about you in every way and your sperm especially. <laughs> but yeah so, yeah, so yeah, we went through IVF and we had ICSI, ICSI, which is where they actually find uh, the sperm that they want to take and they inject it into the egg. So there are so many things that can go wrong here. Obviously, anybody, I won't go into this, but anybody who knows anything about IVF, there's so many, you know, hurdles you can fall at along the way to be able to get the eggs out for a start. Then they've got to produce properly, reproduced and evenly, and then they've got to be graded. And if they're right, you know, they will then choose the sperm if they can get one. And then they inject that in the egg, which can go wrong. It can just die. And then they've got to put that back in you. And then that's got to take. And then it's got to reproduce properly. And then you've got you're pregnant or not. There's so many things that could go wrong. So yeah. all the way through, they're very, you know, let's just, let's say this might not work, but, you know, well, you've only got four eggs, oh, and two have taken, one's not in. Yeah. Uh, there's always a, we were very, this probably won't work. Uh, and it did. <laughs> Must have been quite a shock then when it worked first but, time around. Do you know, it was. And he, David was in India at the time. And um, I, so I got pregnant whilst he was in India. <laughs> yeah, you did the whole process when I was away. Yeah, I went, I went through the process on my own. Um, he, he was uh, playing in a tournament. What tournament was it? I can't remember. Yeah. It might be in the IPL. But they say don't take the test to see if you're pregnant because you can get a false positive first. But yeah. obviously, nobody listens. I was <laughs> testing every single day. Torturous. And I saw the pink line. And I was like, it's there. And then the next day, it was a bit darker and a bit darker. And then on the actual day, it was just there. I'm like, oh my God. Uh, I can't tell him he's in India. I've got to wait till he comes home. And I can remember I FaceTimed him and you were on the treadmill. And I had the test and I'm just looking at him and he's saying I'm pregnant. And he's like, you're like, babe. And I'm going, oh, yeah, I'm just missing you. And he's like, don't cry, it's all right. And I'm thinking, oh, I know, I've got this information, but I can't tell you it now while you're on the treadmill in India. So I waited till he came home and we got married at a little church in, um, in Yorkshire. And um, every time he came home, we used to, go up to the church and sit there and have a little chit chat about things on the church step. And a pack of Maltesers. We did. We used to <laughs> a pack of Maltesers. Yeah. There it was, wasn't there it? There it was, yeah. <laughs> and um, I'd written him a little card saying, so proud of you on this trip. You've done so well, et cetera, et cetera. And he read it. He was like, oh, thank you. And then he turned it over and he said, P.S., you're going to be a daddy. And uh, yeah, it was. A lovely moment. So that church is really special. We got married there and then we've, you know, we've had a lot of memories there. And so, yeah, he were crying like a baby. And then, yeah, everything went great with the pregnancy. I found IVF all right, actually. I, I didn't have a really bad experience with it. I weren't one of those women that were up and down, up and down with IVF. I've always been up and down with my hormones. So I think I just navigated it well. I don't know. I didn't feel terrible like I should on it but then at the end of my pregnancy this is the bit that's very unusual and quite rare I started having very very dark thoughts at the end of my pregnancy now my son's now six he's nearly seven he was a very very wanted baby you know we'd prayed for him we'd gone through that to have him I started having uh really intrusive thoughts about my baby in my tummy and even though he's inside my tummy I didn't believe he was mine and I were having these strange thoughts and I knew still whilst pregnant that these weren't thoughts I should be having but I kept them to myself because then the thoughts became oh David won't want to be with me I know these were all unrealistic thoughts you know that I was having um I I can't really explain the thoughts now but but they were dark uh and then we, i was told jacob was big you see so that was the other thing they were measuring me saying your baby's big and it weren't 
even a, uh, I didn't feel like it was kind how they were delivering this information. It was, oh, your baby's big. Oh, you won't be able to deliver him. Two weeks before he was due, they told me he was already 10 pounds and said, you won't be able to do this. So we think you should have a elective C-section. And I agreed. Uh, that is one of my regrets now. But that's personally pregnancy and decisions on your birth. is so personal. Oh. I decided to do that and I regret that now. But you did the best. I did the, the best time. in that time yeah. with the information that I had for myself and my baby. With you know, the information so. that you were given. Yeah. Mm. yeah. It's not even had. Just remember that the information you were given. I said this to T. It's what the information you're given, isn't it? Yeah. Because yeah. you're making choices of what you're being told. Yeah. But, I mean, Jacob was born and he was only 8'6". Yeah. He wasn't a huge baby. He was a good size. And Healthy I would have been able to do that on my own. And I wish I'd, I wish I'd done that. I wish I'd given him the chance to come out when he wanted because he weren't ready to come out and I believe that now when things that have happened along the line with my son and my health my, my baby weren't ready to come I didn't get that surge of hormone that said your baby's coming here's your boy to love um and uh, yeah he was born and I just didn't know what I felt I mean, I mean your c-section was pretty traumatic yeah as well. that didn't wasn't straightforward really um yeah it was a it was a rough we had a rough i mean i was having my catheter fit and the man that was doing it was chatting to david about cricket and i just remember feeling so i don't know embarrassed mm -hmm. you know and then i fainted i passed out i was so stressed about things that were in my mind that i passed out just before i went into the theater i was on the bed and put the um the cannula in and it'd come out and blood was there and then I was trying to tell them that my baby was distressed because I could feel he was he was taking my anxiety I could feel that he was responding to the situation like I was and it hurt and I was like my my baby's distressed and they was like yeah 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 anyway when you're playing for England next mm. <laughs> I was like okay <laughs> um you know yeah anyway some decorum it, yeah, it anyway. was it wasn't nice and that's not, I know people that have had such a lovely, calm, mm -hmm. gentle, magical C-section experiences, but that wasn't mine. Mm. And I just think it added to what happened to me next, which was um, I had my son, who I love with all my heart. But in that moment, I just didn't know what I felt. And that now as a mum... And I've been his mum for nearly seven years. I feel so bad about them feelings because oh, I, my boy needed me. And I was going, hmm. Um, I now know that I had something called purple psychosis. <clears throat> because the thoughts that came after that, I mean, I won't go into the experience that I had at the hospital. But it, it wasn't particularly pleasant. And I think that added to what was already brewing. Um you know, oh, your baby's big. Oh, good job you didn't have to push that out. Like comments like this to a young woman that's just had a baby that I was looking at this baby thinking, I don't know, I didn't want anyone to take any pictures of him, did I? Mm. I didn't, I don't know. It, it, it was such a, it's such a sad time now. And I look back, at it, I feel so sad that their moments were stolen. I felt like they were just taken from me. These first minutes of being a brand new mum where I should have been like, my baby boy. I was just like, I, I need to find him a new mum. That was what the thoughts were in my mind. Um, how do I get this baby a new mum? Because I can't. And there were never bad thoughts about Jacob or never wanted to hurt Jacob, or there were nothing like that. They were all about myself. And, uh, yeah, they were. it was horrible. And I would have never have thought I would have had them thoughts or I would have been that girl because I was a strong, independent, you know, I didn't mind any stressful situation. I dealt with that, you know, my background, I was, you know, been in a lot of stressful situations mm. before I would have said, no, that won't happen to me. Mm. And it hit me like a ton of bricks and I couldn't, there were no escape in these thoughts that were coming and they came thick and fast. Did you, did you talk about them together? Like, well, um, so 
we were sent home after Jacob had been in, um, he was in a little incubator for a while because my blood had got into his body and he's positive and I'm negative and he was quite sick. So we were in the hospital for a week, quite a stressful week to say the least. I'd not slept and you know how it goes. Oh, I can't even imagine. And I'm sat there looking at my baby having really bad thoughts. Like, and the thought that was going through my mind is, when when I'm out of here, how do I jump off something really high? Oh my, it makes me so upset to think I had that thought now. Because it, I, I was just, it wasn't that I was tired. It wasn't that I was scared of being a mother. It was just, you need somebody better. There was one moment that just sticks in my mind the whole time. Because my mum came to stay for a few days when he was born. And I, I was in bed and I didn't want to be near him. Because I believed, this is crazy. This is, I believed I was emitting a poison that if he came near me, he would die. And that's the thoughts that are just so unrealistic, you know, and just not real mm. or true in any way. And my mum came to the door and she had Jacob in her arms and she just said, darling, your baby needs you. And I said, don't bring him in. Don't bring him in. And I couldn't explain to her because I'm poisonous. Mm. I was saying... Just take him away. Um, I got ticks. <laughs> uh, I went, I dropped weight so fast in like five weeks because I was just shaking all the time and I, I couldn't explain what was happening to me other than I just didn't know how to be a mum to this little boy and he needed a new one. And I, I, if I didn't have David and the man who he is, I wouldn't be here. So I feel like... When I hear these stories of women who do something drastic or impulsive, my heart breaks because if that would have been me. Mm. Because all I was thinking is, how do I escape this feeling? How do I escape? How do I escape? Just such an, an out-of-body experience now. And I think back, how did I manage to think that thought? Because now all I can think about is I need to be immortal because I've got to look after my two babies and I need to be the best mum I can be. And that is one of the motivations as to where we are with um, our health journey now together is just basically to be the best parents we can be to our kids because, you know, it's been a bit of a bumpy ride. And that was just the start of our journey and my health struggles. So the the psychosis that I had after I had Jacob had to be treated there and then, mm. you know, and did they, did they catch on to, to yeah, that? They or, did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think what's really, what's really interesting, what you're saying was, you know, you said a few times like, oh, I just didn't feel like I could be a good mom or I, mm. you know, I wasn't a good enough mom. And in what, everything that you're saying, it's like, even when you were struggling with those things that were beyond yourself, because mm. those are, you know, medical issues, those are the strength of hormones and all of these different things going on. You were still in a way being trying to be the best mom to him mm. because you were trying to stay away because you thought that there was a danger there. So it's amazing that even in those struggles yeah. that you were going through, your instinct was still get him a new mom naturally to, to try protect. and protect him mm -hmm. yeah That's funny. but of course we just give out to ourselves if we say that yeah. you know we're wrong so i just wanted to, to say that because yeah. i just really feel what you're what you're saying because you do like in those moments you kind of you expect that your experience is going to be this happy beautiful mm. lovely experience that everyone talks about but people don't really prepare you as much or aren't as brave to, no. to talk about the the challenges and I've since spoken privately to the mums mm. who have had similar experiences and I've opened up to them about mine and we have, I've seen them relax into a, oh, mine isn't as bad as yours then and this was normal then. And it was one of the things, one of the reasons why, I, I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to speak quite openly about my experience because it might help somebody else and, you know, it, get them through a period where they're just thinking that they're alone when they're not. This mm -hmm. happens, it happened to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, the journey after that, it wasn't quite as dark for a long time. So I did have some help. I had some serious therapy. I was lucky that I could speak to my husband and he 
went and got that help for me, um, the medical attention, because obviously his wife's telling him that she's going to throw herself down the stairs. He, you need an advocate. Yeah. I have to ask, things. David, how did you feel? Because, like, you must have been watching all of this and listening to all of it, but I'm guessing at the same time having to be a cricketer at the same time, I'm guessing, as well. So it must have had a massive impact on you. And Yeah, it, I, it was tough. I mean, it was around that time I almost fell out of love with the game because I felt I need, I need to be at home here. Like, the cricket's taken me away from place that I need to be but as you know we touched on before we we came live like you're juggling you know if we need to keep a roof over we need to be able to you know carry on with life and the needs of you know life but actually my wife's really really not not very well and it was it was really difficult um I think was it eight weeks old we went to Australia and you know I had a conversation with your dad about what was the best thing to do here whether and I felt really strongly that, you know, it's, get it. I mean, this was November time, and you know what the weather's like at time of year in the UK. It's pretty, we pretty, went to pretty miserable. So we we went to Australia. We got on a flight. Um, Jacob was eight weeks old, and and we went to Australia and for two, three, two, months. three months, didn't mm. we? Which in itself was scary. I mean, I was on this plane with Eight his baby. Weeks, yeah. Mm. yeah, but we had to be together, and we were lucky at the time that you were playing for a team. The Perth Scorchers and Justin Langer was the coach there and he was very, very supportive of our situation. You know, it could have been very different if it was um, you know, somebody who didn't really understand family values, but he was he was very supportive about that. But yeah, that was the best thing that I knew that I couldn't be there on my own. If David left me alone with a small baby, you know, that's that's only eight weeks after giving yeah. birth and oh, you yeah, just told yeah. us the story and mm. it's eight weeks. But I was on some serious medication as well, so they'd oh, put okay. me on some strong medication for psychosis so i was basically a zombie yeah you know? i was gonna say because that's going to totally oh, impact yeah you know and all that, the other bits it has that sort of that's what i'm dealing with now and detoxing from really yeah because you know i've i've suffered from having what i, I think was really needed then i'm not sure what would have happened if i hadn't have had that then mm. um i can't tell you what would have happened if and they taken something that was just getting me through the day because I was I was withering away, you know. I was getting smaller. I wasn't eating. I was it, my, my my son needed looking after. My husband was playing, you know. Um, so, but that was the best thing that happened to me was going to Australia and just being away from the normal life mm. around us, and we settled into a. A routine in Australia, and then we went to New Zealand, and then David was on tour with England, and we travelled with him. So at the time, it was me with a baby strapped to my front, and David's playing for England, bless him, and he's trying to play for his country and look after his wife, and nobody really knows that I'm sick, and it was, you know, we kept it all pretty quiet, really, didn't yeah, we? Then, we did. um, I mean, you get home with a new baby, you don't know what you're doing anyway. Like, <laughs> I hadn't even been around. <clears throat> children that much and and especially newborn so i got home and i mean i look back at pictures now of me holding jacob and i'm like oh my gosh i'm so awkward i have got no idea what i'm doing mm. let alone you know having a wife that's finding things really difficult as well so but this is the thing because even in like you know i don't want to say like a tick box amazing kind of you know perfect healthy pregnancy birth experience because i don't actually believe that there is that out mm. there um it's at, like it's I, I say it's discombobulating like it literally you don't know what you're doing you're mm. trying to find your feet there's so much going on never mind when you have not only the extra layer of traveling and being abroad and trying to you know kind of focus on your career but then also you know these added struggles that I'm glad to hear that you had some support, but it never, you know, there, there's often, OK, well, have this have this drug or, you know, do this mm. thing and you're fine now. But, you know, by the sounds of things, you're not fine and you're trying to balance all these mm. things. It's yeah. incredible. But that period was the most stressful test in time for us, which when we look back now, we get sad because we thought that was going to be the magical time. We've just got this baby we've been wishing for after IVF, being told you can't have children. And then actually, um, I didn't know if I could care for him or if I wanted him. Yeah. And that was the, the shock for me and for David. And, you know, our relationship was, 
if if we hadn't been solid and I hadn't had the support or, you know, I don't even care to think of what would have happened. But <laughs> there, there is a, a happy side to it. Mm -hmm. So when we came back home, I'm still um, <laughs> medicated. So I'm... Um, I felt like I, I was seeing life through tracing paper. And that's all, the only thing I can explain it was like, you know, I'd never taken any antidepressants before or anything like that. This was uh, a new feeling of not really feeling anything, but I were okay. I could go through life and I could do what I needed to do for my son without breaking. So in that sense, the medicine was good mm. for me. Um, and, it, and then... <laughs> actually uh it was uh, it was eight jacob was eight months old and uh i was going out with the girls i don't i didn't really drink anyway but i was going out and having a night out with the girls after a long time of not socializing and being away and david had said to me could you do me a favor could you just do a pregnancy test before you go out because i just want to make sure and i was like what we were stuck in traffic, weren't we? <laughs> <laughs> and there was a pharmacy where we were stuck. And I was sat there thinking, I recognise this behaviour. Like <laughs> oh, honestly, <laughs> wait till we get home. I'm not sure she likes me anymore. Like, <laughs> I think you might be pregnant. I was like, like in the car, I'm like, what? Uh, yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah. I think actually I said, I'm not spending £10 on a pregnancy test when we've been told we can't have children. <laughs> He's like... Just so. go get one. He stopped the car and he went, get out and get one. So I went and got one. He came back. He was like, ridiculous. What do you mean I'm pregnant? How, why would you think I'm pregnant? And he was like, you're behaving how you did before. Very careful. Yeah. Yeah. One foot out the door of the car, maybe, yeah. just yeah. in case you're saying it. When yeah. we went home and um, I went into the downstairs loo and before I'd even washed my hands and looked, and it was just boom. Wow. You wow. are pregnant, Cass. I came out and I was like, oh, yeah. and he was making a coffee or something. He'd be like, you're joking. I was like, ah. He went, don't kid. You know he said don't kid about it. I'm like, I'm not kidding. And I fell on the floor crying, going, I can't do this. I can't do it again. He was like, it works. It works. <laughs> <laughs> Babe, it works. This is a miracle. And honestly, I remember he was like, Babe, we can do this. This is a miracle. This is great. This is great. It's amazing. It's fantastic. Don't cry. Don't cry. And I was just like, ah. but the weirdest thing, and I will always tell this story in such a positive way because I really, really believe my daughter Maeve, who is the most amazing little girl, she's a diva, she's a handful, but she is, she's like this little ray of sunshine. And my experience in her, in the pregnancy with her, completely different. So I came off the medication then because I, I was very much, I mean, I didn't even take a paracetamol when I was pregnant with Jacob. Mm. And I was very conscious about what I put in my body, what I didn't, what supported my pregnancy. And, you know, I was like, that's it, I'm coming off. Just came off them. Did, oh, yeah, I was going to ask. So did you titrate down? No. Did you just be like, nah, getting no, off? No, I just you? stopped. What, how did that experience go? I actually, well, this was is it? the thing that's strange. I didn't really experience anything negative coming off I don't know yeah. what happened other than my pregnancy was making me feel good I'm guessing the progesterone and the pre-gestational the the hormone, the hormone yeah. was supporting me and making me feel calm and okay that that famous uh, was it relaxing relaxing the, 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 oh the, that's the muscle relaxing yeah so it. it comes out and just chills you out a little bit as well doesn't it the relaxing no Okay, okay, I'm, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna be quiet now. I'm gonna be quiet. I don't know. This is always a, yeah. 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 he'll like make these statements, and I'll come in and be like, no, that's no. not it. But the interesting thing in my IVF process, yeah. So when you take in the injections, and then you actually you get the suppository things, so you yeah, get yeah. progesterone. They were what I weren't good on. Mm. Yeah, I had a real bad, angry time on the progesterone. Um, things they gave you yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um but the rest was fine yeah but yeah my pregnancy so when I was pregnant with Maeve just such a beautiful pregnancy I just felt so fine and lovely and nice and I were I was still <clears throat> I was still reserved I guess with Jacob and life in general like but I was coming back I was coming back but I was so adamant I was not having a c-section mm. and I was like this baby will come when she wants to come. I'm going to listen to my body. 
I know I can do it. Um, Mother Nature has given me this baby. I can do this on my own. So I'd, I'd written a real detailed letter to their midwife for when we get to the hospital saying, please, please understand my journey because I didn't have a nice time last time and I want to claim this back. And I just said, you know, you give that. I can't, I won't be able to explain, given that I'll probably be in labour. <laughs> so <laughs> can you give them this letter? And, <clears throat> and you know what was so lovely this next time? The midwife had read the letter and when I walked into the room, she just cried and hugged me. Mm. She was like, don't worry, I've got you. And it made the difference wow. that I had this personal touch that just, she just said, I, I feel you, I see you, I've heard you. Yeah. And I'm with you. And it just made the difference like I needed. As it happened, I was in labour for four days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. And, and you are a was better like, woman than myself. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I'm so good. No, nope. I'm not doing it. I'm clenching my seat. It was here. <laughs> yeah. Four days. Why didn't they tell you that it could last this long? I mean, they did not prep me for that. <laughs> but... Her heart rate was fine. She was just chilled the entire time, weren't she? She's the, like, I the, don't know what you're bothered about, was, Mom. I'm cozy. <laughs> they'd given me epidurals, which now I am actually relating to histamine because yeah. I've learned so much. There's so much to kind of come back to. But so I'd had three, four three. epidurals. They didn't work. Uh, they didn't work. <laughs> oh, they worked for a minute or two. So I was like, oh. I said, I remember going, oh, I can, this is great. I've had the epidural. I can, I can still feel the contractions, so I know. And they went, you can still feel it. I was like, yeah, am I not, am I not supposed to? They went, no. Well, I can still feel it. And then they came back. So as it happened, I was paralyzed. <laughs> I'm Jeez. still going, oh, oh geez. <laughs> it was not sexy. <laughs> it was, yeah, so it was bad. And then I'd been awake for four days, obviously, as well, so... You must have been beside yourself. I, I was. I'm so. I'm just like. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> so you strong. The, oh. It's funny that there's like how much you're you've taken it in such a positive light. Like I know we we probably conclude on this, but can I just say like we've we've only gone halfway through this this conversation, and the strength that you two show is just it's it's inspiring. It's actually inspiring and so beautiful. Oh, thank so you. so beautiful. Like really, it's it's making me smile because like it. it makes me feel stronger about my relationship with T as well. Yeah. And it's making me feel so appreciative of like the partner that I have and the partnership that you guys have had because that connection that you have is so strong, mm -hmm. which is just incredible. Just I think incredible. what you need sometimes when you go through these, like, let's be honest, just absolutely. Like there's nothing other than like chaotic mm. to describe what, what you're <laughs> saying. Cause like no one, no one tells you when they're talking about their birth stories and you're going to have a baby. No one's <laughs> like, oh, yeah, you could like be in labor for four days. And yeah. the epidural nobody told me that at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be intense. Intense yeah. is the word, you know? isn't it? It's the crazy thing was, though, even though it hurt so bad, I, I think about that labor and it just makes me feel so happy. And I remember even then going, I'm so thankful I'm in labor that I, I've had that hormone saying your baby's coming. doesn't matter what happens now. My body has put me into labor and my baby is saying, I'm going to come soon, mum. Mm -hmm. And I was just so thankful for that. Mm -hmm. And that is all that I was thinking about right up until the end where I was literally just, <laughs> and the doctor <laughs> took spend, you well, outside. Yeah. yeah. Well, I walked down to the midwife desk and I was like, they could see them talking about it because she was, she was spent. She had nothing oh. left. And I was like, look, she needs a C-section here, doesn't she? And they were like, yeah, but she really doesn't want one. I was like, no, nah, I think it's time. Um, and even that was a com an emergency C-section, a completely different experience oh. to a, an elective. Mm -hmm. Like it was so different. The doctor cheese. came to me, the surgeon, and he leant so close. I felt so bad as well because I'd seen him several weeks before and he was a different one that I'd seen. I was so anxious. I was like, I can't see you. I need, I need the same one. And he was like, okay. And I was a bit mean to him, you know, because I was on the defense. Mm. When he came to me and he just leant next to me, he was like, I'm going to look after you. I'm like, okay. Because I was so frightened. Like, I was so frightened, wasn't I? Mm. <clears throat> About having this C-section. And um, they wheeled me in. And also they'd said to me, well, <laughs> since you could, could still feel the pain after the epidurals, <clears throat> we're going to give you a nerve bl blocker. If you can feel anything at all when we cut you open, we'll just knock you out. 
okay. Oh, that's not what you want to hear. I'm like, okay, just to top the experience off. So yeah, I was like, promise to that do. you'll knock me. Out. Yeah, just promise. <laughs> he was a bit of a chirpy guy, wasn't he? And he just said, do you want the good news or the bad news? I'm like, the good news. He says, we've started and you didn't feel it. Okay. But what happened then in the next few moments when Maeve was born, I can't explain to you other than it was some, maybe something spiritual that happened. It wasn't medical. It was the only way for me to, for you to get the picture of what happened is when she was born and she was lifted up and he lifted her up to me and showed me. I just felt like someone had lifted a dam up and all the love that I had for Jacob at home and my son, it just all came with it. It just went, and I was like, and I loved her and I loved him. And I'm like, I need to go home. I need to see my son. I need to go to my son. Everything's fine. And honestly, it was like it was mended. That's all in my mind. I felt that was it. That was, I need to go home. And it was like a real feeling. I could feel the touch. I could feel and smell and touch the world again because I couldn't before. And it was different. And she brought with her all the love that I was supposed to have when Jacob was born and that's why she was sent obviously that's what I believe I truly to, believe she was sent to that to you then, yeah. and the difference was I mean you were you went home that night didn't you was like are you sure I can go home and sleep and I was like yes yeah, fine I'm fine <laughs> yeah don't worry and he's looking at me like who are you mm. and um so that that was the start of a very different Carolyn mentally again I felt like I was coming back obviously I have um, some anxiety about the trauma, obviously back then, but it's not it's not the real feelings. It's it's from the past feelings. Um, but unfortunately, that was when the physical health struggles happened. And that's where my real health journey started, not my mental health journey. My physical health journey started after Maeve because um, I've since learned a lot about my body through testing and just trying to gather as much knowledge I can about why this happened to me, why my body responded how it did and put the pieces together. I'm not saying I've got all the pieces together correctly just now, but that's been the process that we're up to. Mm. Uh, about, what was it like seven months after Maeve was born, my body started to hurt. That's all I can explain it. My body started to hurt. Not my mind. You know, I was still having ups and downs. Tired mum. Hormones, um, but they're the norm. Yeah. You know, what I would say is normal to yeah. go through because there's feeling stressed and anxious about life. And then there's them feelings that I had are very different before. So mm. I can, I know the two. Um, but my body started feeling sore and I bloated up. I mean, yeah, there was COVID and we didn't look after, you know, yourself as much as, but this was different as well. I was getting pain, having migraines. Can I ask is just to get the distinction. So you said that happened around seven months. So would mm. you say that you kind of had, a, I don't want to say like a normal, but like a relatively normal kind of post-birth healing, yeah. the normal, as you say, like yeah. anxiety stresses you get a, around that. And then because I feel like it's that kind of seven, eight, nine month that you just kind of start to steady out mm. a little bit. And then you're saying kind of almost like an onslaught of different physical symptoms yeah, it was. came about. This, so I had a real, I guess, healing journey with your C-section scar. I would have said that was fairly normal. Mm. Um, I actually, it was my second C-section and I healed so much better than the first one. Mm. Um, but yeah, and then... The symptoms that I was getting, the migraines, um, body pain, backache, um, everything seemed to swell up, neck pain, and then I had shooting pains down my arms. Um, I was just in pain all the time. And then I was dizzy, couldn't stand up. And then I was moody and very angry, but I was in pain, so it's hard to distinguish what was, you know, I couldn't look after the kids properly. I was foggy, David's working, I'm like, mm. I was just hurting, like powering through days. 
And then it got really bad. So they were giving me migraine tablets. It didn't work. Suddenly I was like, these aren't working. Um, they sent me to a neurologist. They put me on this drug called is it teripiramide? Teripiramide? Teripiramide. Yeah. yeah. For epilepsy. I didn't have epilepsy. They just said, oh, here you go. It's Nothing's one of the common working. drugs of migraine that I prescribed. Yeah, we, we did a whole video with one of the migraine specialists about this. Right. The pyramids, yeah, quite often. It's normally, I think, like the second, third, when they're like really, really bad, the first one to work, they'll stick you on to pyramid, yeah. Yeah, well, I just yeah, went yeah, like, say, yeah. I'm just, I'm like, what am I doing? And mm. it was at that point, I started searching online for things because I was at a point where I'm like, I don't want to take this medicine. I don't know what's wrong with me. I found a doctor who... Gave me a light bulb moment, really, like a defining light bulb moment where I'd watched some of his podcasts, I'd read some things about him, and he had said about finding your root cause. And that was the first time I ever heard the word root cause. And it was a doctor called um, Dr. Patrick Flynn. Yeah. And he wrote a book called I Disagree. And I found it very interesting. Not that I'm saying I'm aligned with everything, I don't, you know, but I liked hearing what he had to say because I like whether I agree with it or not. I'm like intrigued as to where, where you've got where you've come to that conclusion and why. So that's what I was listening to. Um, and he runs a practice called the Wellness Way in America. Um, so I joined that practice and they sent me for labs. And they were the first practice that looked at my labs that the doctors here had looked at, the same bloods, and they'd gone, you're fine, you're within normal range, off you go. There's nothing wrong with you. Well, clearly there's something wrong with me because I'm having migraine. Nothing's working. Like, I thought I had a brain tumour. Um, I, I can't move. Oh, I've, I've put on like a stone and a half. Oh, well, you're in your 40s now. And there's men, but, I'm, but I'm not. Like, there's, uh, they weren't listening. So I, I gave my labs to the wellness way and they straight away looked at it and said, how is a woman that doesn't drink, doesn't smoke and this is your food diary this is your lifestyle. Why are you one point away from getting non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? And I was like, what? Yeah, we need to run these other tests on your liver. We need to have a little look at what your hormones are doing. I did the Dutch test. Basically, it, I found out that all the hormones I'd taken for the IVF, they're all still in my system. Did a gene test. I still don't really understand the ins and outs of that, but I would take in all the information I would get from these people and piecing it together mutation in MTHFR gene, mm. the detox process, et cetera, et cetera. So I could see that every single hormone, you know, the dial on the Dutch test, it was just, <laughs> dun, 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 you're just full of these hormones. So they said, there's no fix for this other than we just need to give your liver a rest, start to support your liver. Nobody had said this to me before. Nobody had said, have you done a food intolerance test? Have you done a liver test? Like, what, what, what's in your body right now? What do you put in? Nobody said any of this. It's the first time. If I'd have continued on all them jokes, my liver would have just kept packing up until I was really sick and liver would finish. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I detoxed my liver, being that I didn't give it any sugar, any seed oils. I looked at the foods I was putting, and this is going back like two and a half years now, so this is when we started, and David said, I'll join you. This is, we'll do it together. Right, let's get you well. That was the first point that our real eye-opening health journey started because I then suddenly dropped a stone and a half, not from excessively exercising, but from stopping putting things in my body and from supporting my liver. Mm -hmm. That was it. Mm -hmm. So that was suddenly like a, oh, I feel better. My migraine stopped. And then they put me on some supplements for my liver and they helped me. I saw a functional practitioner who looked at things differently. Suddenly I felt aligned with them. I was like, right, okay. Yes, she was like, Makes just get sense. off all this stuff. Leave it. Let's start working on this first. Let's peel back the layers. It's not going to be quick. Let's do this. And I just suddenly felt, okay, this is the right thing. Um, and that's what introduced me, introduced me to alternative therapies as such and looking at things from a different way. And it just worked. It wasn't a quick fix, you know, but my migraines went, my periods then returned and I had one every month in my Wait, 40s. What? Yes. Okay, that, that's, 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 that's very interesting. Yes, I now have a period every 32 days still. That's amazing. And that I've never had that amazing. my entire life. That was from changing my diet and looking at what my personal body needed from looking at some genetic testing 
and some detox testing and some liver, like what actually, my, how my Living. own body works, mm. not how he worked, not how the, you know, normal range worked, but how mine worked and what mine needed. And that's, that's where I started. And then a year into it, I was just feeling so much better. Mm. Um, but then we got to the, what brought me to you guys with the toxic prevent. So we did have a funny chat on the phone because I was like, I'm going to put you in touch with Tracy. I think this is this is more of a Tracy conversation to have. I remember yeah. that. It was a good, it's a good chat that was. As long as you can put up with Tracy's baby brain. <laughs> <laughs> which, which I still have. So we were completely aligned. <laughs> I came off the phone. I was like, I found a lady I really like. She just totally got me and she understood everything. And oh, and he was like, thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> I do think it like because I've been through health struggles as well or even just I mean I come from a very conventional medical family Mm -hmm. and I really do believe there's a time and place for that it's not a this or that I think um it's more just trying to open the narrative and talk about the wide range Mm -hmm. and I really do think we underestimate the power of just feeling heard Mm -hmm. you know um because once we're once we feel heard you can kind of just like ah now let's have a chat yeah because there's not that layer of like oh are they going to think i'm crazy or i'm making it up or it's all in my head or Mm -hmm. you know or even giving me that feeling that this is hopeless you know like i'm just going to have to keep going down this trajectory and you know there's no options Mm -hmm. i think we really underestimate the power of feeling heard and also common sense something that um is probably going to look crazy as you were talking is I was just everything you were saying I was just nodding my head because I was like yeah just common sense like yes science is important and yes this is important but also does that make sense for your experience Mm. is what I'm telling you on this paper is what I'm diagnosing you with is the treatment that I'm prescribing. Does it make sense for you and how you're feeling? And yeah. that's so important, but we just miss it out completely. And we just overlook, you know, I remember feeling like, oh my gosh, I've been so stupid. This makes so much sense. How did I not even see this? Like I was so blinded. I just went along like a lemon and mm-hmm. took that drug. I mean, yeah, I trust you because you're the doctor. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm just poisoning myself. I was going against my gut instinct of everything was saying, this is wrong, this is uncomfortable, I don't know. And then when I, you know, obviously I spoke to the functional practitioner, she's like, there's other ways, like you just get, get rid of that. Mm-hmm. It felt right. And that's not me saying that medicine's wrong. It's not when the time's right. But for something that you need to find out what the root cause is. You know, if I, if I get, you know, gunshot wound and you're in the, the ambulance in the hospital and it's like life-saving treatment you're not going to turn down the medicine because you know that it's like the 11th hour you need it but when it's something like hormones and health when when nobody is saying to you when the doctors are not saying to you Mm -hmm. what's your lifestyle like that's a simple question yeah what's your lifestyle like not just looking at the bloods and going oh you need a statin yeah don't just assume based on the test it's like oh well you're in this you're within this range so you must be doing something wrong or you know there must be something at fault like, why aren't we providing context? Yeah, mm. and I mean, I also found out through the testing about <clears throat> that I don't do well with anything synthetic. Yeah. And that I obviously have trouble absorbing that and excreting that. Yeah. Had I had known that and known to support myself afterwards and how to do that, I would have probably had another, a completely different experience. I may not even have suffered with the purple psychosis because we know, I know now that that can cause ferocious depression if you are not absorbing what you should. And the folic acid, I was taking mounds of that. I was told to take folic acid. Yeah. Why didn't With they the just MTHFR, tell me to eat a piece of broccoli? Yeah. Like, I'm like, what, what, why did I take that? You know, why didn't you just tell me to eat properly? But that's where I'm saying, you, know, you feel stupid. Actually, it's not. It's just we're so trusting that these things are the right things to do. I, I took that tablet thinking I was supporting my pregnancy and my baby, doing everything that I could because it didn't have the knowledge or their education on it. Well, That's, I think this is the problem, yeah. though, because I think that we're taught to go to an expert in their field yeah. and just, you know, take everything that they say as as gold, as in yeah. like, you know, oh, you're the professional here in any field, not just the medical field, but you're the professional. Mm. You're telling me to do this, so I should do that and go away. And that's almost how we're raised. Mm-hmm. And it's not saying that, again, you know, there isn't lots of positives from from that space. But I think having this message out there that you need to 
trust in yourself and what you're feeling as well. Yeah. And not just kind of blindly take what someone's telling you. I am. Um, I saw mm. we saw the Mindy Peltz um, conference the other day yeah. and she said something and it was so simple. And she's like, ladies, we need to be asking our doctors the right questions. Mm. And it is it's it's knowing what to ask your doctor and having the confidence that, you know, your body and yourself and you haven't just referred to Dr. Google and they're going to dismiss you and dismiss you for for suggesting what it could be. So it's having the comments say, no, I know my body and I know that there's something that's needed elsewhere. Like ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. And that's what I feel like I really want to encourage is it's not that don't take medicine. It's ask the right questions. Do you need this? And are there alternatives that might not cause you other problems along the way? Because if I'd have been in this mindset before I'd had IVF and had children my experience was highly likely completely different oh that's the fact 1000% because everything you're saying in terms of you know those genetic snips and you know you mentioned your liver a few times mm -hmm. like when you spoke to me I was just like that makes total sense like you know um and I think I, I, I do want to make the point as well, because I know we're talking a little bit about like conventional medicine and functional medicine and nutrition and things like I think your message is important across the board because like every professional comes with with biases. You know, I'll have biases yeah. based on my experience, mm-hmm. too, and my education. And so no matter what type of professional you're speaking to like, you know, test them, ask them questions, push mm. them, don't just, you know, whether it's conventional doctor yeah. or a functional doctor or you know any any of that because we all come from it from a different place how does a therapist start a, start a meeting appointment they would say this is your space you need to feel heard and that's that's the thing that people miss out on yeah. because when you're sat you know when we were talking we had our first conversation it's not about what i know or what i've had it's about seeing you and hearing you Mm. because it's even in a relationship you're both understand this if the other person doesn't feel seen or doesn't feel heard what's the first thing you're going to do you're going to put boundaries up Mm. you're like right i don't feel i don't feel seen i don't feel heard and you will just like you will just call them to a ball and i think that's something that's so overlooked but in the story that you just shared you just said like when the doctor came to me and said like it's going to be okay i'm with you you felt seen, yeah. you felt heard, mm. and everything just changed. It was a flick of a switch, and it just changes mm-hmm. so much people. And I think, you know, Tracy's put down the head there. It really gets missed so, so much. The personal touch, and it's the care, mm. it's the health care, and that's the bit that I think is, is very lacking, unfortunately, that, you know, lots of people don't get the care. So, but, yeah, that was a... I mean, I was lucky that I had the support at home. Mm. Um, I mean, <laughs> to be honest... The, our, David and I are in so in tune. I mean, I I now <clears throat> suffer with stress for David, <laughs> which is one of the things that triggered the histamine overload. Yeah. We recently moved to Northampton and David um, decided to finish his international career. And um, I felt he was treated really poorly through that process. I felt so emotional watching him be who he is in that process and just you know as a wife that's on the sidelines they can't speak on his behalf that's just watching him go through something painful I took all that pain on myself and I was just so upset and I had um I guess an emotional reaction and my stress caused a flare-up which I didn't know what it was that's when I came to you guys because what on earth is this I've been well Suddenly I've got this migraine. Suddenly I had this rash on my face. I was doing everything good, you know, I was working out. I, was, I would say I was in good shape and, you know, we just moved house. Yeah, it was a stressful time, but suddenly I was having all these physical symptoms again, which I now know is a histamine overload and one of my biggest triggers, which I, I can see now through my diaries, my food diaries and my daily diaries and things that I've done to work out what what is triggering me because you've got to do that yourself you have to find out you can't just say oh i'm feeling like this or it must be that or i'll just take <laughs> that tablet you have to find out and have a look at what you're doing in your day what you're eating because i'm thinking it's foods i'm thinking you know but it's not it's actually none of them things it's an accumulation of things that have built up and i can see now when for me personally 
when I am emotional, my emotional bucket is still full. So if I get upset, I'll come out in this rash and I'll get a histamine triggers there. It's it's that for me. So I had a real trigger through that process. And it, it obviously said your histamine bucket's too full now. Mm. And over it's built. So, you, so you're, you're, this is this is the start of like your histamine journey. Yeah, I never and knew then, anything about it before. I mm. knew I knew it was histamine sensitive from my DNA test. So they brought that up, saying you have the gene that's you're probably more sensitive to histamine than others, maybe. And I was like, oh, that makes sense because I'll sometimes have hives. You know, it didn't bother me. The only thing that I had was oh, when I was even when I was young. Well, look, I could write my name in my leg and it would come up like a bum. That's fun. <laughs> Yeah, oh, wow. that was about it. So I was histamine sensitive, but it never bothered me elsewhere in my life. You know, it, I wasn't restricting any foods. It, I wasn't getting rashes on my face. But I do know that histamine can cause him hormonal imbalances. Mm -hmm. What came first, the chicken or the egg? Did, mm -hmm. did my histamine sensitivity trigger some hormonal imbalance? Because I know also from my DNA testing that I've not got any of this genetic reproductive issues from my parents. Yeah, that's fine. So something's happened environmentally along the way that's that's triggered that. Um, but yeah, it could have been histamine, probably was, you know, that's over the years I've suffered with these and not really known because now I know I have a histamine overload right now that's come from, I've been through a lot, you know, mm. this is, my book is full from a lot of stuff over the past five years. Um, but it's actually a really good thing because I know now and I can see I have a answer. It might not be that it's the one that I like, <laughs> but I have an answer that mm. I can deal with and manage. Mm. Whereas I'm not going, okay, yeah, give me that tablet. I've got a migraine. I know I can't have that tablet because it's going to cause this. Okay, you know, I'll take that cream or I'll, I'll yeah, it doesn't matter about that toxin. And I'm mindful now about what I put on my body, what I put in my body. I know that it impacts my life, but I can deal with it and I know what it is. So in that sense, I have an answer. I think understanding that underlying vulnerability as well kind of provides a little bit of context for, you know, as you move through your life, you mm. know the what you're sensitive to and what you're not and yeah. what to keep an eye on. So if something does come on now, whether it's a symptom that you've experienced before or a new symptom, mm. you have a little bit more context for kind of figuring out, OK, well, how do I get myself back to, to feeling better? Yeah. And something I wanted to highlight from what you said, which I think is really important, is you mentioned that you ha get quite an emotional trigger um, for histamine. Mm -hmm. So like stress, which is a massive histamine trigger. But for whatever reason, we just focus so much on diet. Mm -hmm. I think because histamine can be related to nutrition and, and how the body works, we tend to just immediately focus in on diet. But that's not the only trigger. Yeah. Actually, mm -hmm. for a lot of people, just going through a re actually going through a really large period of chronic chronic stress or trauma or like any sort of emotion mm -hmm can really trigger that histamine cascade as well, yeah. which then in someone like yourself, having these underlying, I don't even want to say vulnerabilities, because I think we all come with a different mix of genetic makeup. And then depending on where our kind of like checks and balances are, yeah. different things can kind of shoot up. Maybe someone has hormonal issues. Maybe someone gets has a sensitive gut. Maybe someone struggles with mood a little bit. Mm -hmm. And like we all have these different vulnerabilities but I think knowing you know you said having more of a consciousness of where this is coming from at least you can get ahead of it and kind of think okay this makes sense yeah and I know how to how to approach it that's the thing um, gathering all the information up and applying it to yourself giving to what you know about yourself as a person and your body mm -hmm. mentally physically and putting the pieces together like we have to be the CEO, CEO of our own health don't we <laughs> otherwise we're just handing it over to somebody else and expecting them to have the answers. And then we put the blame on them saying, well, you, you gave me this. Well, mm. you yeah. know, it's you've got to take some ownership. It's, it's kind of gutting. It? Like, yeah. don't get me wrong. I, I always joke, like, I wish there was a magic pill because we've been given that illusion mm. that, you know, you wait till something happens, you go get asked for a prescription, you get a pill, Bob's your uncle, mm -hmm. you're done. And like, I wish that was the way. And it's yeah. such a difficult thing to explain 
to anyone who's kind of lived in this system where, you know, you wait until you feel ill and that you, you get your thing, that actually yeah. it's a little bit more intricate and it's a whole body kind of system and a whole environment system. Yeah. Um, but, you know, what you said there in terms of you have your different tools, you know, OK, I'm sensitive to synthetics or, you know, I have to eat certain nourishing foods or David you mentioned the difference you felt between you know eating carb loading and having a lot of sugars for energy versus having fats for energy mm. and it's like mm. having that knowledge in your toolkit and understanding that actually the body is kind of going through ebbs and flows and your environment goes through ebbs and flows um, and that you know you can't just take this one thing and everything's better but actually it can be a little bit more gentle. Yeah. Absolutely. I, if, if, I mean, at the health summit, um, you see a lot of these people that have become so in tune with their health and making decisions externally or internally mm -hmm. um, with what they're doing. They've all been on a journey and it's not until something happens that we as a society very often go, oh, I need to do something about this. You know, we wait for something to happen before, you know, do, making some changes to avoid these things. Whereas, yeah. Yeah. Whereas says, actually, yeah. if we kind of understood these things, I think before something happened, often it wouldn't be so bad. Mm -hmm. Like something we were saying, our daughter recently turned one and for her birthday, we wanted to get her a genetic test mm -hmm. um, to so that we have an understanding, you know, not in an intense way of like, oh, you need to put you Absolutely. need to go on this protocol and you can't enjoy childhood. Not like mm. that, but just to have this understanding of, OK, so, you know, she might be a little bit more sensitive to histamine Absolutely. or maybe, you know, there's a good chance that she could be sensitive to perfumes or whatever. And just having that understanding so that when she's inevit inevitably faced with certain challenges, which we all are, no matter, you know, what mm. what knowledge we have or what, you know, background we have that you can actually provide that context and hopefully prevent mm -hmm. kind of going through all of that massive trauma. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I said that, didn't I, straight away? I said, well, if the NHS wanted to save millions of pounds, <laughs> wouldn't they just give every baby a genetic test the minute they're born and then send the parents away with, well, that's, this is where you need to support your baby. And, what, you know, the, it, you have a, you know, almost a blueprint of, of what you need to do. Yeah. I Are found we ready, though? That's the question, because... Are we ready to understand that that factor as well? Because mm. genetic testing does reveal a lot. And I did a, I did a chat with the Life Code GX team. I, mm. I don't, I'm guessing yeah, you did yeah. a genetic test for them. And it's when I lovely. spoke to them and chatted chatted with Emma and Chloe, and they were talking through it. And the problem is that blueprint that you receive. So many people look at it and they're just like they just ignore it because mm. they don't understand what the genetic test is actually yeah. outlining. And I'm guessing what what came up for both of you? If you don't mind me asking. Mine was mainly the MTHFR gene and the detoxing gene and the and histamine the liver. gene. Yeah, and yeah. the liver. So. And, and you, Dave? Dave's not actually got his results back yet. So yeah. Okay. I'll wait my results. Uh, yeah, we've gone with a company called Body Fabulous in London and now they test, every, you know, it's available now for people to go and get these tests and get the information for themselves. Mm -hmm. But it's the service afterwards to e explain it in layman's terms and to help. I mean, the different companies, there's Ominous that do it as well. They've actually got a good traffic light system mm. so that you get a report and it says it almost in um, quite a, it's, an, it's informative, but they do it in a traffic light, you know, risk, high risk, low risk, moderate. And then you can go into each gene that you want to explore given on this traffic light system that they've explained. It's quite a good report they can back. I mean, there's a lot of different yeah. systems out there now that are doing these testing. Uh, Gary Brack has got his 10x one and he's doing the five main genes, isn't he? And then, but, um, yeah. well, this, I think this is the challenge, isn't it? Because I think genetic testing is such a powerful tool. And actually, when you have that attitude of, you know, oh, this is providing context and I can help myself mm. and this is great, it can be wonderful. But I think, as you say, one of the big challenges with the kind of private testing industry and particularly in genetics is that it is very easy to um, get into a space of fear mongering mm. and um, you know oh god they, I have this you know APOE gene is, is a big one that comes up or I have these certain genes that are associated with these really really scary conditions mm. but actually in a clinical mind often 
it isn't as scary as it might be perceived because it it, it can be powerful and pre- prevent yeah. these things by having the knowledge. Yeah, and different people will resonate with different things, which I think is probably why there are such different, you know, mm-hmm. characters and people that talk on the same thing because you know you need a different thing from different people but when you go through that kind of experience that there's so much to it it's really hard to know well where do you start where's the middle where's the end it's also when I'm seeing so much of myself in in others Mm -hmm. I want to grab that and go no it's okay yeah like this is what this is and if it's not it might be this and Mm -hmm. and I can help and but I can't help but here's the information and these are the people can and this is what this might you need to you, you change 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 your view yeah like think it's okay all these things come out that I, I just can't kind of get it out quick enough. <laughs> Can I just say though, just to say back to one thing, that's the reason why TikTok spent still. You know the the, the mold mycotoxin aspect of it, right? If you read the reports on food and what was actually in food, that will scare you because mm. there are studies done, and that's why, like you were saying, you can't say so much about it because if you do, people just think. One, you're a conspiracist. Mm. You'll get called yeah. that. Yeah. Second, I'll start calling you like, oh, this person's iffy. Like, don't talk to them because yeah. they're just like on, on their off their world. So you just don't say anything. Mm. And thirdly, like, oh, he's just trying to sell more product. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I, I, what I do... Because we I don't own Tax Prevent, mm-hmm. by yeah, the way. It's, we, it's just one of our brands. We went after that because of what it is. Yeah. yeah. And so... I, I tell people because people always go, but you're the histamine. You're the histamine people. You talk about histamine. Like, what else do you do? And I, I've just started being honest. With people I say, Look, mm. I still take it. They're like, why? I'm like, I used to have urticaria. I don't have it now. That's but, the urticaria. I was telling David. Yeah. yeah, and I was like, now I take it purely for the fact that I've read the research. Mm-hmm. It's a binder and it will take out all the toxins that I'm exposed to. And I, I can always tell the days where I've not taken it versus I've taken it. Mm. Because, yes, my liver and kidneys are good. I've had a kidney test done. The doctor was like, you've got the kidneys of someone that doesn't drink alcohol. Like, it's really, really strong. But I can always tell, like, if I have a long gap of it, like, we're stressed. Like, look how stressed you was, like, just as a parent. I know, babe, honestly, I get yeah. it. And you're stressed just as, like, being as a, a parent. parent and-, <laughs> and, you know, both of you are working in that career and it's crazy. But you said that stress triggered your histamine response. Mm-hmm. But if you tell people that, they're like, no, you're talking shit. You're you're emotional. You're just you're just emotional. You're going through it's a hormonal thing. And you're it's not like even gaslighting. It's just they're trying to answer something that doesn't need mm-hmm. an answer. Yeah. And you're like, right, this is histamine. If you go back to the basics of it and say, right, my body is stressed and I'm under so much pressure, the histamine bucket's overflowing, mm. all I need to do is just detox. They're like, oh, it's another smoothie thing. It's green vegetables. It's really not. I find when, um, so I, the anticipation of something is when I go the worst. And mm. I only know this from like documenting it and mm. seeing what, what the pattern is. And so if I know David's got a trip coming up and I know there's going to be a period of time that I'm on my own with the kids, I might just sound so blasé to what do you mean when you're in your kids in that big house and da da da. It's a stressful time. I've got two children, one in daddy, one in all these things from mummy, navigating life, school, da da da. I get stressed about it before it's happened. And I start having a build up of, mm, even though it's, I have to do things, I have to actively work on keeping that stress down. And it's hard because. You know, that's why I was trying to find other tools like the ice bath and all sorts of different things. Not that I'm just like, oh, this is brilliant. It works for me. But I was trying to find what helps keep me down regulated to build up. Do you think that was, um, were you like that before you had kids? Or do you think that that kind of thing of, you know, where your head is kind of going like, oh, and we need this, this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and then that could happen. And then, like, anticipating if there's, like, a dog across the street. No, that, that, like, that was me. I know. That was, yeah, that was totally me. Yeah. I, I've never been able to regulate my emotions. I yeah. am exactly like my son is now. But I understand it now. Yeah. And, um, you know, I never had, I, I didn't have kids. I didn't have the constant worry because it's Wasn't almost like pushed. you can't, it's, I love these children so much. I love him so much. I am so, I, anything I feel is big. Mm. that's just my makeup I can't change it I I'm happy it's big I'm sad it's big I'm anxious it's big it's exactly the same as my song I have to work really hard on regulating my emotions another thing for my gene test when you look (laughs) so when you look at the report that Omnis did actually when the traffic light system 
red, 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 red. I just look like the angriest woman in the world. And they they, they explained <laughs> to me. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> David, like, oh. I can't remember what the jeans were. David was scared. He just, eyes just looked. He's like, uh oh. But uh-oh. He's, they explained it to me in a really simple term. They said, you know, when you're at school about this certain gene, I can't remember which one it was now because they've all got the funky names on it. Yeah. Um, he says, you know, when you say, oh, flick him with a pencil because he snaps really easy, it's a real thing. Because there is some people that are lacking. So if you imagine this gene, I can't remember which one it's called, and it's like a sausage is what they explained to me. And in between, there is um, a, a gene that grabs the dopamine. So if you flick that person and if it has that gene that's not got a mutation, they'll go, what are you doing? But if they do it to you, you'll go, what? Yeah. Because your brain hasn't gone and grabbed the dopamine. As I've got older, I've learned to manage that anger, that reaction, that reflex and that, um, you know, how, how reactive I am. But it's in my genes that I am incredibly reactive. That's who I am. And now I manage that. So as part of my stress, well, before David goes, is how am I going to keep my reactive personality to a minimum to take care of my kids and not impact them negatively? Don't want them to see mummy angry. Don't want them to, you know. So then I put this pressure on myself to manage myself mm-hmm whilst managing my kids' emotions as well. In a really unique situation where, you know, not many families have the daddy going away playing for England and playing for somebody else and da, 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 and okay, I've got to get them to school. Then I've got to pack their bags and we're going to go to India for four weeks and then we're going to come back and then daddy will come back after two weeks and then we're going to move house and then we're going to put, you know, this is, there's always something big. There's never been a year that we've been together it's just going, oh, this is chilled. Yeah. I will say though, the way that mums think or partners think is very different from the way dads think. And we always joke about this because you'll be like, <laughs> well, well, the way that, and David's look at me. Yeah, yeah because, it's, and, and I always say to Tracy, I'm like, there's things that you that you think of that I just didn't even think to think of. And I'm just like, am I a bad dad or a bad partner? And I'm like, no, this is the difference between mums and dads. Like dads can be the fun, like pick the kids up and be crazy with them. Yeah. But mum's like, no, I need to remember this, 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 this. Yeah. And it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing that you do. Well, that's the reason that I asked in terms of was it something pre kids or post kids? Because, um, like, I do think it was always an element of my personality, but maybe it was that it wasn't ever pushed enough. And I mm. think I very much put that into like my workspace as opposed to personal. Yeah. But since having a kid, it's like I can't contain it. It's mm-hmm. just like. Boop, 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 boop. And like before we go to bed, there's like twenty <laughs> things, and Dilly's like oh, I was just about to like get into bed and I'm like, oh, have we done this and this and this because we have to leave by this time and this Uh time. And I do think, you know, I don't want to say it's something that like is inherently, you know, mum versus dad or whatever, but I definitely see that pattern. Yeah. Um, And it's really interesting that balance between, you know, definitely something hormonally led, but biologically led Mm -hmm. and then, and then genetically it's just, it's led. Just kind of and our role in yeah. that, you know, in our in the dynamics in our house, we'll say, right, so what trip have we got? You know, what's coming up? What do you need? Oh, I'll just throw it in a bag the night before. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Pardon? Yeah. That's <laughs> well, that's because you've got to think about you. <laughs> now I'm thinking about two children on a plane, on my own, for eight hours, in the airport, get to the airport. Everybody wants a piece of daddy. I'm managing the children. Yeah. But you've got to think about putting your trainers in the bag. But you're like outfit uh, changes. Yeah. What if they have an accident? Do they need toys? Do I they know, need yeah. <laughs> but then, and I'm always the one that looks like rubbish at the back, you know, carrying the bags. And daddy's got his trainers on. The kids look great. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. tell me about it. I, I've got to ask, like, because all the, all the traveling that you've had, you guys do, it must be really, really intense. Like, because I know you mentioned it's intense on the kids and stuff. But how do you kind of prepare for that travel? What is it you do? Oh, yeah. You said you have some, you, you said you there's like tips, specific yeah. things that you yeah. you do or you've learned to do to manage it. Like, please share. Please. Enjoy. Well, <laughs> we, Jacob's been on over 100 flights and he's sick. So we, he got to like six months old and he's been on like 40 flights or something, hasn't he? So the first time we went to the airport was oh, a shambles. <laughs> oh, my God. This is just one kid. That was awful. Oh, yeah. That, you know, we had. So many bags. I mean, we had everything that we needed, <laughs> but we had not packed it into bags. So, like, if you know, any 
bottles or fluids. You know, we've got them in different bags and stuff. <laughs> oh, wow. So we're like, we're trying to empty all our... We must have been... With a baby on your front. <laughs> yeah, we must have been at security <laughs> for like <laughs> half an hour, yeah, 45 it was bad. minutes trying to unpack these bags and and things. But it now it, it runs shambles. pretty smoothly now. It runs pretty smoothly now. So they, we find, I find, because I'm usually the one that packs the kids, because he goes first in business class, you know, and then there's me in... in uh, in the boot. <laughs> yeah. That is not true. <laughs> that is not it true. Has the truth true. Is out, guys. It has been true. It has been true. It has. <laughs> no, but um. <laughs> oh, Dave, Dave, that right? No, this... I'm not having that. <laughs> <laughs> she talks a lot of sense, but that is not true. <laughs> God, God, Dave, give the truth. There, no, what really been, happens? No, the, the kids have been spoiled with she the flights. Yeah, the kids have been spoiled with the flights, and they're really good now. I mean, they're they're five and six now. So they're used to it. So now it's give them their own bag. They have to pack it themselves. But you, I, usually do a little bit that they don't see beforehand because these trips are long. We're not talking yeah. about like an hour and a half flight. We're on like trips to Australia and India. And so I usually give them a bag each. I keep a little plastic bag to the side that I give them in the morning. So it's like new little, some uh, Play-Doh, little thing of Play-Doh each, some pens and pencils. Stickers are always a good one little crafty things that'll keep them busy that, something they that, haven't that you can seen leave yet. on the plane or throw yeah. away so it's a little zippy bag food bag that you give them in their bag you know um snack so we'll fast probably on the fly because uh, it's usually not very good food or food that's going to make me sick or react well there's the time zones as well you end up like just eating 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 yeah, yeah. And flight and it's food and airport yeah. food and then you get to India and it's a different time of day and then your food and yeah. your, your body's all over the shop. But Hung up, food yeah. hangover. Yeah. Yeah. So Alessandro Ferretti did the research on that, didn't he? I think yeah. Alessandro did, is a really good practitioner. He's a great sports nutritionist. Yeah, great actually, sports nutritionist. Right? So he did the, he said that when you're flying to another country and you'll go, whatever that time zone is, eat to that time zone. Mm -hmm. So if they're having dinner, have dinner and that's it. Just to stop eating that point. Yeah. If they're having breakfast, you eat breakfast at their time zone. Yeah. But I don't think we realise the impact time zones has on our circadian clock and how it affects our, our body. No, yeah. absolutely. It really affects the kids. So um, we make flying a treat for them. So it's not like a chore because obviously it's, it's tiring for them as well. So mm. they know they're going to get treats on the plane as opposed to being at home. Yeah. We're just then mindful when we get off the plane in the days after balancing out what they've had on the flight or not. Because they're usually tired and they've had maybe a couple of biscuits and a bit more. But I'll pack some things that Maeve likes a lot of veg so we'll do little packs for her so it's the prepping beforehand minimal stuff all your fluids in one bag boys uh, kids and mum just one so soon you just fly through as quick as you can don't anything with batteries nothing that's got no toys that have no airplanes that make noises or shooting planes that that <laughs> that has had me in uh, trouble a few times, you know, oh like boom, 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 boom. What's that? <laughs> Mommy, that's my machine gun. What? Do you want a machine gun? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know yeah. that kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's not mine. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so it, it's just minimal stuff, and yeah. try and um, keep them occupied with crafts. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, crafts. But um, Jacob, when he was a baby, he. He was a nightmare, weren't he? So we just ended up having to stand at the back of the plane the entire time, you know, like nine hours with the baby. But maybe mm -hmm. she'd just sit down. But yeah, the prep beforehand, their own bag, no small, trip. you carry it. They do some um, really good things now, don't they? That you can blow them up and it feels like the footwell and things. Yeah. So the kids can like lie down and or like roam around in the seat a bit more rather than yeah. Just um, having to sit just in Just having there. to yeah. sit, yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah. They're, they're pretty good. Yeah, they're good. And the pads where you just click the button and it disappears, so they're like just a little flat black pad and they can play and you just click it off yeah. rather than loads and loads of pens and pencils. That's usually good. play does yeah. a great one, though. They'll just make loads of different stuff. I'm so excited for when Rivi's at the age for like Play-Doh because yeah. you know when they're super young there's that kind of cutoff point yeah. and like I hear of all these great toys and I'm like making notes for like when it's ready because before I was a parent you kind of like look at all these things and you're a little bit like god that seems a bit excessive like do you really need that many like toys and snacks and things but then you reach parenthood and you're like 
just give me everything because yeah. like yeah. kids are not naturally supposed to be sitting still on a flight for nine hours so just give me everything because mm. this is survival mm. <laughs> oh, it's, I, I want to ask a little bit more because you just talk about survival side of things mm. like your guys health journey is quite fascinating but maintaining it now like what what have you done what have you changed what's the biggest change that you've done and i know tracy asked a question to both of you and it's the one answer i think hopefully you've been come up with like, what's the worst advice you've been given i think for me it'll be this carb loading like you've you're fueled on on carbs like i've just seen such a big change from when i've made a i guess a drastic change in my diet that been able to metabolically switch between you know fueling on glucose and fueling on fats and the mental clarity i have with that and things i think that's just been a, such a huge and the inflammation as well like getting older say older um <laughs> 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 like aches and pains in sport and things like i was getting to a stage where i was having to to warm up before the warm-up because i was oh stiff and you know but but now like people are going how can you just like how can you just start bowling without warming up and i truly believe like dropping the amount of sugar i'm having and processed foods seed oils so very much on that diet side of things you know interesting that my dad i've just managed to convince him to come off the seed oils yeah and he's very of that generation of oh, i'll be right be right you should be right it's fine um it doesn't kill me yeah <laughs> you know but um, he's now a little bit more open-minded. I said, so what, what else is it you're doing? Because his psoriasis and his eczema on his elbows and knees is just gone. Yeah. And he's really? Like, yeah, yeah, disappeared. Fear. Yeah. That can, seed oil, sorry, come oh, I was just going to say, can I, can I ask you a little bit more just to, because you've spoken a bit about your diet and some of the changes. I think it'd be really interesting to know, like, what does your diet generally look like now what kind of foods do you eat do you take any supplements and things I know in the sports world as well there's that whole aspect that other aspect of supplements around you know safety what ingredients are in them like what what does a typical day of kind of eating and things look like for you now like from a supplement side of things I mean it's a massive challenge for me because yeah. everything's got to be informed sport batch tested so mm -hmm. it's really difficult to find things that are not full of fillers, gums. So I'm literally on nothing yeah. at the minute. I mean, we are looking at, at doing some something in the supplement side of things that for sports athletes, professionals, sports professionals mm -hmm. that are batch tested, but basically trying to cut all the rubbish out of them. Um, you know, even the proteins, protein bars, like you go on the back, there's 30 ingredients full of absolute, it's just, as you say, you talk about packaging is to look good yeah. and then it's just about what they taste like. It's actually not what's in them. Yeah. Um, it's counterproductive. With, yeah. And I also think like in the sports world, because athletes tend to be quite fit, you, you we kind of assume that like, oh, if you're slim or you're muscular or you're fit, you're healthy. Mm. So we just don't really kind of look at, well, actually is all, are all those like binders and fillers and sugars. Additives. Yeah, you See, know, what about the other aspect? Neck in the cans of these caffeine drinks. Oh, these, or the electrolyte drinks, drinks with the sugar. Disgusting. Even Red Bull, like the mm. boys are drinking Red Bull. But even like the energy gummies that they'll give the boys and things, it's like yeah. you won't oh, take really? them because it's... Yeah, it's I don't, I literally don't have anything like, yeah. oh, you might find me on the field like, I have a handful of nuts in my pocket yeah. or something and it's like... Your dark chocolate, doing, you yeah. like your dark, dark chocolate. Those like nut butter little um, sash <laughs> Yeah, so, um, so yeah, I mean, my diet is very much like, it's just all natural stuff. Mm. We try and keep everything processed out and then it'd be very high fat as well, so... As in, um, yeah, not... You know, good, good... Healthy, yeah. healthy fats. What kind of fats do you do you use? Because obviously you mentioned you stay away from seed oils and things. What kind of oils would you use to cook? Or so extra virgin olive oil, um, coconut, coconut oil. oil. Yeah, um, they're probably the main two. Ghee. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've actually got a bit of a dairy, <coughs> um, dairy issue. Mm. Um, so we're trying to just work out whether I'm alright with ghee because it's the because it's clarified the dairy. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So. Um, your breakfast is high protein, avocados, you'll have your sourdough. Um, what else? Have we got? Everything's organic at our house now. I mean, 
I know that's expensive and people will say, we can't buy organic, but we're not buying any other rubbish. So our, our shopping bill, we're not buying these biscuits and a load of other things mm. that so you see in shopping trolleys that's, yeah, we'll just grab this fast food, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, we'd rather buy good quality food. We eat a lot of grass-fed meat. We like red meat. Um, I'm mindful of how much I have for histamine, but yeah. you know, it's you. Um, I mean, convenience food's not cheap. I mean, so often we reach mm. for the convenience food, but actually, it's expensive. Like, the convenience mm. food is expensive if you get whole foods and spend a bit of time preparing them and things, actually. David likes cooking as well. Yeah. So. yeah. I'm but rubbish. It, I also think it's about, you know, if you look at the whole context of things, you know, we think, oh, aren't you lucky to be buying organic and da-da-da-da-da. But, you know, there's so many other ways in our lives that we, you know, frivolously spend money. And also when you invest in your health and you feel better, you often don't need to be buying all those extra, you know, mm. energy drinks or like, you know, sugary bits or, you know, s like all of these different things that, you know, we might once have spent money on, yeah. you don't need anymore. Um, yeah. So I think it's putting context in it as well, because I'm not going to lie, there was definitely a point in my life where I'd look at people who were buying, you know, organic and really expensive oils and things thinking like, oh, well, aren't they lucky? That's not mm -hmm. achievable at all for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but you'd be surprised, I think. Yeah, I mean, you do find there is alternatives out there what were we just saying somebody messaged me on instagram not so long ago having quite a pop at me for saying you know feed your kids some good meat Cause some we get really annoyed that we'll come out of school and we just see this big queue for mcdonald's and i'm like oh please why just i wish you know that that isn't even a treat if you knew it was in that you would not think that was a treat for your yeah. baby it's Let's stop just, using yeah. food as a treat. Like there's other yeah. things that can be treats mm. as well. But um, yeah, yeah she, she gave me quite a pop saying, oh, that's not you, it's attainable for us, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I literally just sent her my shopping bill and said, here's, here's what I've, I've just been to Lidl. Yeah. And this is what I've got. This is how much it costs. And this is how many days we're going to eat from this. Mm. You've just bought how many McDonald's for what? Yeah. For like, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. I so, think there's this, um, there's like a real big push that, if we can't, if we think it's not attainable, we we judge others, mm. and then when we judge them, it just it doesn't work out because yeah. uh, we were talking about before when uh, we had our comfort break. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying that like people are quick to judge, but they're they're less quick to understand. Yeah. Mm. And I think societies move so quickly and everything how they're doing things, they don't understand. And like you, you know, when we were doing the questions and we were preparing for all this, we were talking a lot about like how you guys like have changed the way you look at your health and stuff mm. and it, it must really weird a lot of people out because you guys are like the health optimization summit you've gone there and you did say people were just like oh so what what did you learn mm. but now people must be looking at both of you and changing things like you just mentioned meat like if you mentioned meat in the histamine community the 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 group chats are people like no no you can't eat that you can't eat this immediately so write you off yeah they immediately write you off but you've done it you've proved it mm. that must be very strange for a lot of people yeah i think i mean our social groups like it's because we've made some decisions that you know we're so much of our friendships is food and drink and things and mm. we're trying to make you know some decisions that are best for our health it, it presents some challenges in 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 that regard but um there's certainly a you know that what are they doing what, why are they doing that for or they frown upon what you're doing like you're a bit daft or when or they whatever. see results though you see i mean i'm not gonna lie i got pretty fat <laughs> so what happened to me was well we both didn't like i mean yeah i mean i was sick as well and really? so everybody immediately especially women when they see that you've lost some weight what are you doing yeah tell me everything yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm guilty as charged myself i've done it like what are you doing you look great like are you but for me i was like well I'm eating a lot. You wouldn't believe it. I'm actually eating a lot. Mm -hmm. Probably a lot more than I was mm -hmm. when I was fat. So you're probably not craving so many things. I'm just making mm -hmm. the right choices. I, I, you know, I guess to lose weight, you do count calories. You look at what you, most people look at what they're putting into their body, you know, the calories and the calorie deficit, etc. But I just wasn't. I just was looking at what was the good food, what was going to feed me and what was going to steal from me and or feed my health or feed my disease. And I just made the choices that way for an entire year. And that's what helped me heal and ultimately lose weight from that. Not 
weight loss wasn't my goal. How I looked wasn't my goal. Still isn't. It is always about how I feel, my mind and my physical health. So I just need to be the best mum and wife. And I just need to be, well, I need to be physically fit to keep up with the man 10 years younger than me. <laughs> so <laughs> that is a, that, that's a motive. Yeah. I think now people have seen, I mean, people just see physical, physically, don't they? They don't really understand the internals um, improvement. But they're now coming to us going, so... So what is it you've done? We're getting so many people asking, like, so so what changes have you made? Why? Um, and there has been a, a, a big shift, I think, in that respect. I think as well, because David's now, you know, mid-30s, and he's still out running and the rest with all the young 20-year-olds. They're like, so how are you doing it? Mm. It's like, well, it's actually pretty easy. He literally is just a change in decision making on the choices you make, what you're putting into your body or what you're not. I'm doing less as well. Like I'm in the gym less. I'm doing less running. I mean, I'm only eating when I'm hungry, which is less to be honest. Like I used to be every couple of hours, Fucking like oh, I need something. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's actually made life easier. The other things that we've brought that do make us look pretty bonkers, I guess we've been, because of this journey bringing us here, and it's been unexpected. But somebody said to me, actually, if you stop putting this in your body, medication, <laughs> etc., you are going to get better. I mean, a light bulb moment there. So we now are very open to anything alternative. We're not dismissive of anything. We're not saying that that works, that doesn't. It's like, oh, tell me more. Let's try it. So we have tried a lot of things. And the things that work for us. I tried the cold water therapy. <laughs> you, mm. It was very shocking one morning when I woke up and said, come on, we're off to get in the river. He was like, this was in January, wasn't it? This like, a couple it had just of years been ago. Snowing, and she's like in bed with heat packs and duvets <laughs> and like hot water bottles. I'm like, there's no way she's getting in the river. I was like, all right, come on, let's go down. I, I mean, this was at the very start, wasn't it? Where you're like, I've got to do something about my health. Like, I've yeah, I was, I was like willing to try. It was willing you to try anything. That point. But what I found with a cold water therapy, and it's not for everybody, mm. and it's there's different benefits to it. But there was also another side to cold water therapy that we experienced with my mum who tried it out and got transient amnesia. Yeah. It was bad. Mm. It was very scary. Wow. Yeah. She's fine. She remembers everything now. <laughs> there was <laughs> a very nice mouth here. <laughs> 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 it was very scary twenty four hours. Yeah. But yeah. for me, I found that it really helped down regulate my nervous system and it helped prep me for the day. Mm. As it happens now, I'm not doing it at the moment because I'm trying to just lessen the stresses. But when my body is well enough to endure that stress again, I will do it because it, it really does help me and my anxiety. But that's me personally. You know, if you are going to try it, try it tentatively and ease yourself into it. But for me, that really worked. Mm. Um, the other thing that I find really works for us, and some people might think this is bonkers, but it, it genuinely was one of the things that gave us instant results. We really like the grounding mat and the grounding bed sheets. I love them. <laughs> I love them. Big, big fan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We uh, literally just went, we, were, we just came back from Ireland. Um, we were with my dad and we went for a walk out in the park. And this guy was like, kind of saying to me, he's like, I really want to take off my shoes and, and ground because yeah. the old school way of grounding. Mm. Um, but the the grounding mats and like grounding sheets and you can get like these things that you put under your bed or yeah we got yeah, such a, a great, an incredible yeah. way of so they all think David's it. bonkers because before the yeah. game well in in Pakistan and India like because of the times of the games and you not can't get out of the hotel because of security and one thing or another you find you're in artificial light all the time yeah you've got you just around all this electric electrical stuff and things like you don't come in contact with the ground. So I'll get to the ground, take my shoes and socks off and just walk around the ground a bit. And to start with, everyone was like, what is this guy doing? Like, he's lost his mind here. <laughs> and then all of a sudden they're like, so, so why are you doing that? Yeah. And then a couple of weeks later, someone's going, I might give that a go. And and then next thing you know, they've, they've gone home and gone, oh, I've got one of them grounding sheets. And yeah, um, yeah like uh, it's hard until you do it and actually think about what you feel. You can't appreciate it. Like, yeah. You do feel something immediately. That is something that's really helped us. I, I feel that as well. The other one was we really like the blue light blocking glasses in the evening. That has really helped yeah. us. Because I especially, if, my, if I'm on my phone for too long, I get a histamine reaction. 
It's on my yeah. it's very strange on my right side. It's rash all here. So that's one thing that um, I've, I've randomly found is a trigger for me. But we both like the the glasses um, in the amazing. evening. Have you right. used the um, the app that you can download any screens and things that changes the light? At a certain yeah, but we've got the covers as well, and the kids I mean, have all got you the, put covers. the covers and the glasses are, yeah. are way better. But I think um, for anyone listening, an introductory way, I used to always say like try downloading that app yeah. and then kind of move because I think you know there's there's all different angles into these things. But it's really that's interesting brilliant. technology coming out now. We saw at the summit actually yesterday that there's computers they're making now with these all built in. Like uh, you know, the screens are completely mm. different now. So. I guess that's a promising um, something that's happening in technology that's going to be out soon, I guess. You get an amazing sunset every night with the blue light glasses on as well. Yeah. You just, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like bright orange. You're like, wow. <laughs> oh, no, it's the glasses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so what else is there that we've been doing? I mean, um, we've actually just started using hydrogen water, trying that, which, um, yeah, which is very strange. It's so easy to drink. If anyone struggles to glug water, which I do, you know, it's get your two liters in on whatever you want you to eat, drink a day. Could never drink it. It's so easy to drink that water. Mm. Don't know why. Can't explain to you the science behind it, but I can drink. The it's body absorbs hydrogen. Head, yeah. People forget that. Our body's made mostly by hydrogen. The body yeah. absorbs it yeah, better. Yeah, the minute it gets and into the cells. And yeah. it doesn't have as much to filter. How are you finding being on Toxoprevent so far with your histamine? Yeah, well, I've been on Toxoprevent now for nearly three months. I'm just coming to the end of my um, protocol. Yeah, the protocol with it, and it's been really helpful. Um, my histamine journey is it's hormonally driven, so I do feel like that it's helped. As I said, I had the my my bucket was full I mean, when I spoke to you. I was in a bad way. My migraines, um, the reactions I were having, but yeah, it's certainly helped. Um, and as I said before, I've had so much, so many people say to me about tox to prevent. Have you tried it? Yep, I'm on it. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I'm going to see what you say afterwards, maybe give it a little break and then go back to it because mm -hmm. um, I'm quite nervous about coming off it um, given that I'm managing my histamine well now. I know I've made other changes as well. So, um, so yeah, I'll say it might be that I need to maybe just take it now and then or, you know, give it a break and then do another protocol with it because I, I mean my my histamine overload was quite severe it yeah. wasn't just a little reaction I was having that this was going to solve like a miracle powder um but yeah I mean I'm not sure where I'd be if I hadn't taken it uh but it certainly helped and um yeah it's it's been a pivotal part of my healing journey so far from histamine um Oh uh, yeah, thank that, you. No, that's that's really lovely to hear because it's um I think the thing with that I really like about Tox Prevent or it's what it is is a zeolite, um, mm -hmm. is it's essentially an inert substance. So it kind of just like it's not like a supplement, like a nutrient that kind of interacts with your body in a mm -hmm. way where, you know, there's an upper tolerable limit yeah. or, you know, you need this much or you can't take this much. It's really um, a device to use to kind of just soak up mm -hmm. whatever there's too much of in your body. So if you have too much mold or mycotoxins or histamine is a big one that we talk about. And I mean, we can talk more uh, off camera about this. I, I definitely want to catch <laughs> up. But in terms of you know, we've devised the protocol systems to make it a little bit more accessible mm. in the sense of because most of the people that come to us, they're in a really bad way because mm. we're usually the last, the last stop where they're mm. like, you know, yeah. I feel horrendous. This is, you know, what's going on. I don't know what to do. And I think offering a protocol can be a gentle way to go about, okay, let's do this. Just let's clean up this first layer so your body can actually feel again and it's not yeah. constantly being bombarded. But my goal is, um, is, is always, you know, 
okay, we do these kind of protocols and, you know, almost in a, in a medicalized mind to get you to a state of health. But then the goal should always be, you know, how can we get off all of these extra things? We don't want to be on 20 different mm -hmm. things for the rest of our lives. And how do we transition to that? Yeah. And something I love about Zeolite is that you can actually take even more than we suggest on the protocol. You can take less. Mm -hmm. It's something you can have in once you've kind of gotten that initial flush out of your system, you've gone through that detox and that mm -hmm. cleanse. It's something I like to say, you know, you have it in the cupboard for when you know you might need it. Yeah. Like you said yourself, you've become more aware of what your triggers are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe if you are exposed to certain foods because you're out at a meal or you're yeah. traveling or you know that there's a period of stress and you can feel that anxiety coming up you know the zeolite or tox prevent is something that you can just pack a few sachets with you yeah. when you're going into an experience that you know probably will cause a uh, histamine cascade i've actually used it as yeah. um as a tablet as in like a, a painkiller for me because yeah. i i call it hista head so oh, it's a different yeah. headache to a to a normal headache. And I usually get it on a morning because obviously on an, an evening you're detoxing and you, you know, or you wake up and you have that bolt of cortisol, which triggers my hyster head. Mm -hmm. And I'll say it feels like um, a fat head. So it's not like a headache where it's a pain and acute pain. It's almost like someone's stuffed your head with cotton wool and it's a bit too fat on one side. So if I feel that coming on, I'll take a tox to prevent and that will take it off. So I know it's a hyster head. Yeah, you know, so yeah, it's my go-to because obviously I've ibuprofen is ruled out for me, paracetamols ruled out for me, painkillers are ruled out for me. There's so much. It's a scary thing to think I'm going to be in pain and I can't take anything. You know, I have a histamine intolerance overload, and I can't take anything. There's nothing going to help me. There's no, you know, there's a comfort in knowing oh, if I get a headache, I can just pop a migraine pill. But no, I don't have that option. You know, it's oh, a, there's a few things I need to oh, okay. <laughs> Tell me. A few things. <laughs> uh, I used to be a chronic pain patient. So trust me, when it oh. comes to pain, I have I have all the bits. But that's such a good term that you mentioned, histahead. And it's not something that we've ever said, but it, it rings so true to, to what I know. And I think having those things in your toolbox mm -hmm. that, you know, there's... There's challenge to going through the point to get yourself back to a state of equilibrium. Mm -hmm. And then it's about moving to that place of knowing your body and being able to have certain things in your toolkit where, you know, if this is going to happen yeah. or you experience this, that you do have things to rely on because yeah. none of us are immune to, you know, the chaos of life or the unexpected stresses or illnesses or exposures that we can come up against. But I think it's about understanding things better and having you know those those resources in in place so that we can move That's forward people don't have the understanding and, me, and i'm guilty as charged like that mm -hmm. that was me and that's why um i'm i get so i guess i talk so much about it because I'm like, oh, th th there's answers there's there's ways that you can navigate through this I'm, I'm not at the end of my journey now but i can help you do that I put on my Instagram the other day, has anybody had any of these issues? Just wondering if there's anybody that follows me. Oh, an influx of people. And I was astounded by the amount of people that were saying, yes, I went to the doctor with the same rash that you've got. There's, I know it's histamine. They gave me steroid cream. What? <laughs> really? Oh, they gave me something else for this. Or they've given me histamine blockers. Or they told me to take antihistamines and it got worse. I'm like... Oh my goodness. So I just, I literally send them all the pages I follow. So here you go. Just have a little look. This is where I started. Let me know if you need any help with anything and I can try and navigate you somewhere that I've been that's been helpful. But yeah, it's so much more common than you realize. And everybody thinks it's something else. I've had people that have said, I mean, some doctors have, some doctors that have seen patients similar to me and diagnose them with fibromyalgia when they've got a histamine intelligence, a histamine overload. And they are, they're taking tablets that they don't need to take because actually you just lessened your bucket somehow in other ways rather than taking some ibuprofen, anti-inflammatory that's going to make your situation worse. That's why you're never cured. 
Well, because it, it can take you even further away from figuring out what the problem is, because if you're taking all of these extra things and not just drugs, but like also supplements, like there's lots of people taking lots of supplements yeah. that either aren't the right form or they don't need them. And it it's confusing your body even more. Mm. You often will get even more side effects. It's throwing it's throwing you off the scent, if you will. Yeah. So it's moving you further away from figuring out what is actually going to make me feel better. Yeah, um, it's a real it's minefield. It's wild, mm. yeah. I mean, I personally spoke to a doctor who's a friend and they said, well, it sounds like you have fibromyalgia. Yeah. Like, and then you, well, what's fibromyalgia? And then actually fibromyalgia is a checklist of chronic symptoms that have been there for... Yeah. Oh, of course, let's, <laughs> just, let's, just, let's just throw a word out there. I think and most see, of us have fibromyalgia on our medical yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Honestly, you'd be surprised though. Like, it, it, it really gets on my nerves when people tell. when people throw the word like <laughs> they throw like they throw these words out and they go you know what you've got you've got ibs oh okay so mm-hmm. explain what ibs is oh it's all of these symptoms in here yeah. you've got one of them and like that that's the problem now mm. like i think what we're focusing on is the fact that we're just going to throw these things out we'll see what sticks to you you'll then take it on as a trauma and then we won't give you a solution but we'll just say you've got it and like I, I'll be. I'll say this with with chest, and I'll say it with function. IBS is a term that people use to get you the out the door. They will say it to get you out the door mm. because they'll say it and you go, okay, you've got IBS, and then well, or fibromyalgia yeah. or yeah. these umbrella And terms. companies will hound yeah. on that, and people will just be like, right, you've got IBS, I've got the solution for you. Mm. But you know everything you've talked about today. The one thing that I can take, and I think a lot of people will take from this, is your health journey is your own Mm -hmm. what works for someone else may not work for you and there don't get me wrong there are some generic things that you can do that will be beneficial to everyone but the fact that every single person's journey is different and whether it's your trauma or whether it's the solution you will find it and yeah do share it do share it with the people but as long as you can say that this is my journey and you don't push on to anyone else Mm -hmm. and you just you let it just be part of it you will see benefits you will see successes yeah i think that's why it's important to speak about is why we certainly wanted to come and speak about this i said before i my journey two years ago started when i heard a podcast actually and there was a lady uh, that i was listening to called davinia taylor and i literally stopped the car and was like this lady sounds like me she's me (laughs) and i actually met her the other day actually said and got a chance to say thank you because you know be it that her journey's her own she made me feel like I wasn't alone and I suddenly went oh my gosh she's so open she's talking about her IVF and her mental struggles and her journey to now and her hormonal imba- and what was happened she 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 would been through what I'd been through and I heard her speak and she had come out of it and she was speaking to me I felt like she was speaking to just me and that's why um when we said about coming and chatting to you guys I said I'm going, going to speak because actually she made the difference to me. I mean, even if it's just one person, she made a difference. She made a big difference to me actually going, okay, that's, there's somebody else that's like me. And if there's somebody else that's like me that listens to this, they know that there's, you know, a doorway out there and possibilities after that to get well, to heal in your own way. We really appreciate that. I think, I think um, if you don't mind, uh, you know, if anyone's listening to this and whoever's listening to this, I think it would they be okay just to reach out to you guys on your social media and just ask these questions. Of course. Absolutely. Yeah. So we'll, what we'll do is we'll put or yours... send us some yeah, follow-up questions. If you want to send some follow-up questions, we'll send them across to Carolyn and David. And I think it will tag your Instagrams in, in the description and stuff so people can reach out to you. But the fact that you're you're, you're open to sharing that is amazing. That's a, a lot of people keep this stuff to themselves because they don't feel that like they can be heard and listened to. Mm. And I really... We both... I know I, can, I don't I'll talk for Tracy in this part, but we really appreciate you both coming from here. So I've got the last question I've got to ask you guys. What is the future for both of you now? What's the plan? No more babies. Is that the snip? <laughs> oh, that's the snip. Yeah, so happy to talk about that. Well, well you never know. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, um, you know, I plan to play cricket for quite a few more years yet um i think a lot more years the way your health is at the moment a lot more years <laughs> you keep yeah. eating those good fats <laughs> I think I've got, what was it me- metabolic age of a 23 year old or something yeah so i'm so All envious right. right now i'm um, so envious right now <laughs> so yeah so that and then um 
obviously we want to spend as much time as a family as we can you know the precious years when mm. the kids we've got five and six year old at the minute so mm. um and then on the side we're just exploring a few things aren't we at the minute that yeah we've got a, a few things that are at the very start of development at the minute um be it that we're looking to get some protein and supplements out there that athletes can take without any rubbish in so Amazing. they're just mainly for because we need them <laughs> I was going to say, I'm not an athlete, but I'll take it. I'm always scouring for things that yeah. don't have just quite And there's them. just n- not not that much out there. Certainly nothing that David can take. Um, me personally, only just after, um, you know, six years away, starting to maybe dabble in music again. But Ooh, okay. The very early days, um, I very much didn't want any commitments because I want to be able to be free to travel with David and not let anybody down work-wise. He's been very busy five years for us, very, mm. literally just settled into our new home. So, um, yeah, hopefully continue to share more health things online. That's what we proactively wanted to do is be mindful of actually now talking and pushing through our comfort zone and saying, actually, we're going to speak more about what we do at home in our personal life health-wise so that it may help or influence other ple- people in a positive way. Um, so, yeah, that's that's really the next few steps for us in the, we in the Willie household. We've become really passionate about that, haven't we? Like the, making decisions for you on your health um, rather than just going by what you're told with everything. And hopefully it'll empower more people to do that rather than this is what you should do and do things like us. It's not not what we mean at all. It's, you know... I want to empower people to have the courage to make some positive changes and to trust their gut instincts about what they might feel is right for them personally. You know, whether it's new mums, mums going through IVF, mums that are going through postnatal depression, mums that are looking to change their health, their weight. You know, I, I have been there. I have done that. I have been through a lot. I can, I'm willing to talk and I'm willing to help and not push anything on you i am in no way a professional i'm just somebody who's been there and lived it um and that's that's kind of where we are now it's amazing watch this space is as i think i think that's the the tagline for this is watch this space and interesting things gonna be coming out from the uh the willie household (laughs) i'm very excited for you both thanks so much thank you for for having having us us. (laughs) it's been great to talk to you guys yeah we really appreciate having being on here today and thank you for sharing so much and it's it's been an eye opener and it's made me uh made me have this like newfound love for Trace. I'm like, oh I love you so much right now. <laughs> 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 and <laughs> 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 God, I-